I note that a quorum is present. I note for the subcommittee that Representative Susan Wild of Pennsylvania be permitted to participate in today's hearing with the understanding that her questions will come only after all members of the subcommittee on higher education and workforce investment on both sides of the aisle uh, who are present have an opportunity to question the witnesses. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on scaling up apprenticeships, building on the success of international apprenticeship models. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member, and this allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I recognize myself now for the purpose of making an opening statement. Before I begin, I'd like to thank our distinguished witnesses for traveling across the globe to testify today. We're delighted to have you. The committee appreciates the time you've taken to prepare your testimony and inform us of the structure and outcomes in your respective apprenticeship systems. Today, we look forward to learning more about the apprenticeship systems of Australia, Germany, and Switzerland, including how these systems strike a balance between strong government oversight and the flexibility to meet the needs of employers and the labor market through innovation. We hope to use what we learned today to strengthen apprenticeship opportunities here in the United States. A U.S. registered apprenticeship program has long provided Americans the opportunity to learn valuable on-the-job skills and earn a stackable and nationally recognized credential that serves as a pathway to the middle class. It's my hope that we can work together on a bipartisan basis to help scale this model. For years, the Australian, German, and Swiss apprenticeship systems have been the gold standard of apprenticeship programs around the world. And they are not only highly popular and well-supported, but they also provide nationally recognized and portable credentials valued by apprentices and employers alike. In Switzerland, fully 1% of gross domestic product is dedicated to apprenticeships, with the private sector covering 60%, the cantons or states funding 30%, and the federal government covering about 10%. In the US, this level of federal support would amount to approximately $20 billion per year, nearly two times the total discretionary budget for the entire US Department of Labor today. Some impressive numbers. In Germany, the dual system of vocational education and training supports the economy and contributes to a youth unemployment rate of 5%, the lowest in the European Union. And this compares with 12.7% in the US, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In Australia, the apprenticeship system offers more than 500 occupational apprenticeships and traineeship pathways including a digital apprenticeship program open to anyone of working age. All three countries, all three countries have implemented research and evaluation components which support the continuous evolution of the system and adoption of evidence-based best practices. So during our discussion today, we'll examine how these successful international apprenticeship systems utilize substantial investments from both government and participating employers. I'm excited to hear from Dr. Simon Marti, as I was so impressed during my visit to Switzerland with how their apprenticeship system is integrated into their education system and provides permeable pathways for students to choose from. We will also examine how successful apprenticeship systems look to their state and federal governments for strong national standards to ensure consistent quality and strong protections for apprentices. I look forward to exploring how the German apprenticeship system relies on recognized occupations and training regulations to set nationally recognized quality standards for apprenticeships. These standards ensure that apprentices earn credentials that are recognized not only by employers across Germany, but across the European Union. We will be especially interested in learning how successful apprenticeship models expand into new economic sectors through employer collaboration, union involvement, and adoption of guardrails to ensure quality. I am particularly eager to learn more about the Australian apprenticeship system, which incentivizes new apprenticeship opportunities in high demand occupations, while also 
prioritizing the recruitment of underserved groups such as Indigenous Australians and people with disabilities. Today's hearing is, is truly a unique opportunity for this committee to discuss best practices for strengthening government oversight, industry, innovation, and educational alignment that we can look to to apply to our national apprenticeship system. These discussions will be a crucial resource as this committee considers apprenticeship legislation to strengthen apprenticeship opportunities for all Americans. Thank you again to our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to our discussion. I wanted to also note that I'm pleased to be proceeding with this hearing on a bipartisan basis. I now yield to my colleague, Mr. Smucker, for his opening statement. Thank you for yielding. I'd like to uh, start by thanking the chairwoman for uh, scheduling uh, this hearing. We've had personally and uh, in this committee had multiple discussions about the benefits of apprenticeship and earn while you learn programs. And so this is, um, this is gonna be a wonderful discussion here. We've, we've seen a surge in interest uh, for apprenticeships, uh, both here and I think it's fair to say across the world as more employers and small businesses recognize the critical role that apprenticeships play in the development of the skilled workforce. These important programs combine on-the-job learning and classroom-based instruction so that workers receive the development they need to get and to keep a job. Uh, successful workers obviously uh, lead to uh, successful businesses and uh, growth in the uh, economy. Uh, internationally, apprenticeships have transformed workforce development. And so today I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses from Germany Switzerland and Australia, so that we can learn more about each of your unique apprenticeship uh, systems. We know that no two countries are exactly alike, uh, and the system that you have may not work exactly uh, here in the United States, but we can certainly trade best practices and learn from each of you here today, and I'm looking forward to that. To ensure that apprenticeship programs in the U.S. are successful, uh, committee Republicans will continue to support efforts that ease the regulatory burden that many employers face when participating in registered apprenticeships. After all, employers know best what skills their employees need to succeed in the workforce. Employer-led innovation should be encouraged when it comes to work-based learning. We must also work to better integrate education and the workforce so that in the classroom and on the job development work hand in hand to propel all students to excellence and success in a rapidly evolving economy. A crucial aspect of education reform will be addressing the job skills gap in this country, which has left thousands of jobs unfilled in our booming economy. Apprenticeships are real ways that we can give American workers and students the skills they need for successful careers. Today's hearing will allow members to learn more about the variety of apprenticeship models and how we can better innovate to help Americans pursue opportunities that lead to personal and professional growth. So thank you again to each of the witnesses for uh, being here. We look forward to your testimonies. I want to thank our distinguished ranking member uh, and remind uh, all of our members that you are able to insert written statements into the record. Uh, and must submit them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. on July 30th. I'm pleased to recognize my colleague now, Representative Joe Courtney, to briefly introduce our first witness appearing before us as a witness today. Great. Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman uh, Davis. Um, as co-chair of the Friends of Australia Caucus, a bipartisan uh, caucus of members from the House, I am pleased to introduce Mr. Tim Bradley, Counselor for Industry, Science, and Education for the Department of Education at the Australian Embassy in Washington, D.C. In that role, uh, Tim is well-versed in Australian apprenticeship programs, and during his time in the U.S., he's immersed himself in our job training system and challenges and can offer some very useful perspectives about ways we can both learn uh, from each other. I'd also note that he's the first witness from the Australian Embassy to testify before Congress since 1994, and he wanted me to extend his thanks to the chairwoman for the invitation uh, to be here. They're a great ally uh, of our country, and again, we share a lot in terms of uh, approaches to everything from uh, common um, values and interests and, and uh, certainly education and economic issues. So again, we're pleased that he's uh, joining us here today. And with that, I'll yield back. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Courtney, and I'll now introduce our remaining uh, witnesses. Dr. Sylvia Annan is a senior researcher at the Federal Institute for Vocational Education and Training in Bonn, Germany, which oversees the coordination of all parties involved in German apprenticeship systems. Dr. Annan, as I mentioned in my opening, the committee appreciates the distances that you've traveled and the time that you invested in helping us learn more about the German apprenticeship system. Dr. Simon Marti is the head of office of Swiss Core, the Swiss contact office for European research, innovation, and education in Brussels. Until June of 2019, he headed the Office of Science, Technology, and Higher Education at the Embassy of Switzerland in the United States of America in Washington, D.C. Dr. Marty also began his career as an apprentice and will be able to provide firsthand insights into the Swiss system. Uh, as I mentioned to Dr. Annan uh, just, just now when we spoke, I wanted to extend our appreciation, of course, for your travels today and the time that you've spent informing us uh, and also thanking you for the trips that uh, my staff and, and other colleagues took to Switzerland to learn more about their Swiss apprenticeship model. We appreciate all the witnesses for being here today and look forward to your testimony. I want to remind the witnesses that we have read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to committee rule 7D and committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five minute summary of your written statement. I also wanted to remind the witnesses that pursuant to Title 18 of the U.S. Code, Section 1001, it is illegal to knowingly and willfully falsify any statement, representation, writing, document, or material fact presented to Congress or otherwise conceal or cover up material fact. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it will turn on and the members can hear you. As you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green, and after four minutes, the light will turn yellow to signal that you have one remaining minute. When the light turns red, your five minutes have expired, and we ask you to please wrap up as quickly as you can. We will let the entire panel make their presentation before we move to member questions, and when answering a question, please remember also to turn your microphone on. I first recognize Mr. Tim Bradley. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Smucker, members of this committee, thank you for inviting me uh, to this hearing today. Uh, I'm very honoured to participate. Uh, a special thank you to Congressman Courtney, both for your leadership on the Friends of Australia Caucus uh, and for that special introduction. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Bradley. I am the Minister Councillor for Industry, Science and Education here in the, the uh, Embassy in Washington. Um, the Australian apprenticeship system is essential to developing highly skilled and qualified workers who drive productivity and deliver the goods and services that underpin a sizable part of the Australian economy. The Australian apprenticeship system delivers nationally recognised, stackable, portable adult and youth apprenticeships that are designed in partnership with local industry and promote access to small, medium and large businesses. Through a combination of productive work and structured learning, Australian apprenticeships offer the opportunity to, to obtain a variety of qualifications, all the while earning an income. Anyone of working age can undertake an apprenticeship and they can be started while undertaking the final two years of school, known as an Australian school-based apprenticeship. I'm using the term Australian apprenticeships to cover both apprenticeships, which are a structured training agreement, typically three and a half to four years. Uh, they cover uh, skilled trade areas and result in a portable industry-recognised qualification and also traineeships, which tend to be shorter in term and typically cover non-trade occupations last between nine months and two years. The Australian apprenticeship system is a shared Commonwealth state responsibility, where broadly the Commonwealth, more specifically the Department of Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, develops policy, administers the Australian apprenticeship support network and provides incentive payments. And the states and territories which have responsibility for registering administering training contracts, and providing support throughout the process. In addition, the Australian Apprenticeship Support Network provides free, uh, free advice and support before and, uh, before and during an apprenticeship. ASQA, which is the Australian Skills Quality Authority, the national regulator for Australia's vocational and education training sector, which regulates courses and training providers to ensure nationally approved quality standards are met. And the NCVER, the National Centre for Vocational Education Research, 
which is the national professional body responsible for collecting, managing, analysing and communicating research and statistics about the sector. A short note on vocational training in Australia. The VET sector, the vocational education and training sector, uh, VET is provided by registered training organisations um, who provide nationally recognised courses and qualifications and off-the-job training. They include what we call TAFEs, tertiary and further education colleges, private institutions, industry organisations and individual businesses. Competency-based training packages are developed in consultation with industry and provide a quality-assured standard of training. An integral part of the Australian apprenticeship system is the group training model. Group training organisations enter into training contracts with apprentices and place them with host employers. Group training organisations assume responsibility for quality and continuity, continuity of an apprentice's training as well as providing support services throughout their course. The group training model allows for students to rotate through a series of host employers and facilitates employment with employers that have seasonal or project-specific project labour requirements. It also offers as apprentices a richer training experience. Financial incentives are provided by the Commonwealth Government to employers at the time of commencement and completion. Standard incentives devi uh, vary depending on the state and territory, but can, uh, can have a value of up to 4,000 Australian dollars. In addition, specific, oh, sorry, in addition spe special incentives are also provided uh, for those um, undertaking uh, qualifications in identified skill shortage, skill shortage needs, those with disability, school-based apprenticeships, mature age workers, and for rural and regional, um, rural and regional apprentices. Apprentices in priority occupations may access income contingent trade support loans worth up to $21,000 to assist with their living costs um, while undertaking the apprentice. apprenticeship. About 160,000 apprentices commenced in 2018. Some 260,000 are training at the, as of the end of last year. This represents about 2% of the total workforce. Most apprentices are technicians and in trades, including construction workers, automotive and engineering. Uh, community and personal service workers are the next largest category. Apprentices, are, uh, for the most part, they are, are male, about 200,000 in the system, compared with 63,000 females, and mostly aged under 24. The number of apprenticeships, apprentices in the system has stayed relatively constant since about 2014. The Australian government recognised, sorry, is committed to an ongoing, <coughs> sorry, the Australian government recognises the impact that new technologies, global markets and changing demands will have on the workforce. We have built a system that reflects the need to be adaptable and responsive to those needs and provide core skills required to satisfy the demands of the future. The Australian government is committed to ongoing reform and improvement of the apprenticeship system and to the VET system at large. A review of the VET system was undertaken last year with an eye on how the government can ensure millions of Australians have the skills they need to succeed in a changing labour market. I am pleased to say that a whole of government task force has just been established to implement those recommendations. Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Smucker, thank you again for inviting me to speak today. I hope this has, has been useful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Uh, Dr. Annan. Thank you, Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Members Mucker, and Honourable Members of the Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Investment for inviting me to testify today. I work with the German Federal Institute for Vocational Education and Training, the BIBB. The BIBB is the recognized competence center for researching and developing initial and continuing vocational education and training in Germany. It performs its task based on the Vocational Training Act and works closely with the federal government, the German federal states and the social partners, the employer organizations and the trade unions. Our institute is committed to the principle of a dialogue between research, politics and practice and promotes innovation in, initial and in uh, national and international vocational education and training. Today in my testimony I have been asked to introduce the German dual VAT system. This system provides a nationally recognized vocational training framework by working with the industry to determine qualifications and training. The dual system of vocational education and training is a major reason why Germany has such a vibrant economy and the lowest youth unemployment rate in the EU. It equips apprenticeships with, uh, apprentices with found qualifications through its unique combination of theory and practice, learning and working, hence the name dual system. 
Participants are thus offered a debt-free, highly attractive and recognized training and career path after the end of compulsory schooling, either as an alternative to university education or as a complementary option. Job skills are a key ingredient for commercial success in the United States as well as in Germany. German companies, also the one in the US, are particularly well positioned to provide their workers with these skills, drawing on their experience with Germany's vocational education and training system. In Germany, the federal government stipulates the statutory framework and thus creates a legal certainty for all those involved. But there are two main components to the system. The company component of dual training is regulated in a nationally standardized manner. The school-based component guarantees that specific reg uh, regional characteristics are taken into account. A statutory framework is required in order to create harmony between the two learning venues and the dual system. All of this together guarantees equivalence and recognition of a training occupation across Germany. In Germany, 52.4% of people utilize the dual VAT system to enter the labor market. Dual VAT provides a track in the vocational training system of Germany, though not the only one, and typically leads to employment earlier than higher education. In addition, access from dual VAT to higher education and vice versa are mutually possible. Dual VAT qualifications open up a range of professional opportunities for graduates. <laughs> VAT certificates are nationally recognized throughout Germany as qualifications for employment as well as for continuing education. Because certificates are nationally recognized, graduates have the advantage of being able to find work throughout Germany, a key criteria in ensuring labor force mobility. The dual VAT standards are based on the real-world employment requirements, with economic need often driving the updating and development of national dual VAT standards. Employers identify new requirements within their workplaces, which lead to new occupational qualifications. A consensus between the social partners is mandatory to start the development of a new or the updating of an exi existing occupational qualification. In practice, the social partners and the government negotiate and adopt new standards for in-company training, the training regulations, under the guidance of the BIBB within multi-stakeholder expert groups which represent the employers and employees, as well as the federal government and the federal states. These groups meet at the BIBB on average five times over a period of about half a year to discuss and develop the training regulations. The education standards for vocational schools, the framework curricula, curricula are developed and updated in parallel and coordinated with the in-company training standards, the regulations. Dual VAT standards simply formalize previously agreed upon standards by all relevant stakeholders. Hence, the standards are not simply imposed from above, but when finally promulgated are orally accepted by the same stakeholders who are tasked with implementing and monitoring them. Most importantly, they are agreed to by employers who require these skills. The standards guide the delivery, monitoring, supervision and support of the dual VAT nationwide. The quality assurance guaranteed within the system is essential for its acceptance and success. The key aspects in this regard are the cooperation of the government, the business community, and the social partners. The learning within the work process, the acceptance of national standards, the qualified vet staff, and the institutionalized research and advice. These quality features could provide some guidance toward which, towards which elements of the dual wet could be utilized for strengthening quality of wet in other countries. I hope that was awesome. thank, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Marty. Marty. Ranking member Lloyd Smucker and the other members of the House Committee on Education and Labor for this invitation and for the opportunity to testify about Switzerland's apprenticeship model. My name is Simon Marty, and I'm the head of the office of SwissCore, the Swiss contact office for European research, innovation, and education in Brussels. Until only a month ago, I was heading the science and education office here at the Swiss Embassy to the United States, where I was closely involved in the Swiss-American cooperation and apprenticeship. The Swiss State Secretary for Education, Research, and Innovation has asked me to represent them in this hearing today. It is a pleasure to be back in Washington. Apprenticeships are the most important upper secondary educational pathway in Switzerland. Around two thirds of our youth start a three or four year apprenticeship program at age 16. 
after having finished compulsory education. They can choose from roughly 230 different occupations, which cover all sectors of our economy. Apprenticeships are comprehensive dual pathways, which include an educational part of typically one or two days per week at the vocational school and the practical part, usually with a private or public employer during the remaining three or four days each week. Apprentices do not have to pay tuition. The employers pay them a small salary, thus they earn while they learn. I would like to highlight three key features of our apprenticeship model that contribute to its success. It only works so smoothly because the involved actors work closely together in a public-private partnership. The employers play an important role. Over one-third of all Swiss companies that are able to train apprentices choose to do so. They hire young apprentices and offer them the opportunity to learn in actual work streams supported by an instructor. Furthermore, the employers, via their professional organizations, are playing an important role in designing apprenticeship programs and updating them on a regular basis. The cantons, which have roughly the same role and autonomy as states do in this country, are providing the vocational schools and career counseling. They also supervise the apprenticeship programs in their jurisdiction. Federal legislation guarantees nationwide portability of the different degrees. The federal government supervises the functioning of the system and supports its further development by working with the cantons and professional organizations to adapt it for the future. This division of labor reflects how the system is funded. We invest every year more than 1% of our GDP or $9 billion into our apprenticeship system. About 60% are contributed by the employers, 30% by the cantons and 10% by the federal government. Although the employers contribute the most, they see, they see a positive financial return on investment in terms of costs and benefits. A second success factor is that the apprenticeship system is an integral part of our permeable education system. You can start out on an apprenticeship pathway and if you have the aptitude and interest to do so, move on to university or further professional certification. There are no dead ends in the system. Multiple options are open at all levels of education. Lifelong learning is a reality in Switzerland. Young students and their parents typically perceive apprenticeships as strong foundations for a promising career or for the continuation of one's educational pathway. The permeability of the Swiss education system also makes it easier for our workforce to adapt to new de developments on the labor market and also to personal interests. Finally, apprenticeships are labor market oriented. Apprentices learn to work with the latest tools and equipment that the school could not typically afford, but a company needs in order to compete in the free market. Furthermore, when an employer is offering an apprenticeship position, it also means that this occupation is relevant in the labor market and there are typically job opportunities once the apprentice graduates. The Swiss system has many positive outcomes. It offers young people a meaningful perspective, prepares them to enter the labor market right after graduating from an apprenticeship program and earning a good salary already, already at age 19 or in their early 20s. This contributes to a low youth unemployment rate and offers our economy and society the skilled workforce that is necessary to compete in international markets and to flourish. Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Smucker, members of the Committee on Education and Labor, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, now under committee rule, uh, 8A will now question witnesses under the five minute rule. I've decided to go at the end, so I'm gonna yield to our next senior member on the majority side, and he will be followed by the ranking member, and we'll then alternate um, between, between the sides. Mr. Great. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Davis. Again, I wanna congratulate you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. Frankly, I wish we did more of this in terms of really learning from other examples around uh, the world. So uh, again, kudos to both of you. And thank you to all the witnesses for, uh, again, really informing us uh, this morning. Um, Mr. Bradley, again, just to, using Australia uh, as, a, again, um, an, an example of a, a country which we can learn from, uh, here are the similarities. Uh, Australia is a market economy. 
Uh, the structure of its government uh, consists of a federal uh, level uh, and also a state level, which you sort of alluded to uh, during your remarks. You also share with us the fact that you are experiencing a skills gap just like we are. So uh, obviously we, we are sort of all interested in trying to uh, learn from each other's ways to, to fix that. I guess what I would ask you to do again is if you could sort of walk through the architecture of the, the arrangement that exists right now in terms of, uh, again, the, the various organizations, so specifically the registered training organizations that provide nationally recognized courses and qualifications uh, for the training portion of an apprenticeship using your nationally recognized company-based training packages. Again, if you could just sort of walk us through, how are um, RTOs, um, you know, what do they consist of? Where, how are, who, who basically um, oversees their performance um, and again, in the context of just sort of explaining the architecture and governance. Of course, thank you. Thank you for the question. So, uh, let me let me reiterate. So, the the vet sector and apprenticeships uh, in Australia is a commonwealth, a shared commonwealth and state responsibility. So, we have a mechanism we call okay, just for uh, to translate um, into our English. So, commonwealth means federal in the federal government. Thank so. you. So a shared responsibility between the federal and state, state governments. Um, so we have a mechanism through which the federal and state governments can get together and kind of have these robust discussions and kind of work out a, uh, a coordinated policy, national level and state levels, and how that can interact. And that's called the, uh, the Council of Australian Governments uh, Industry and Skills Council, so COAG Skills Council. Uh, the council gets together on a semi-regular basis to, to have these issues. Um, and they can uh, set policy and respond to different demand factors that we're, we're seeing in the market. For example, skill shortages. Where are the priority skill shortages? Um, what where are the gaps that need to be to be addressed? Um, that process is kind of working its way through the system now in terms of skill shortages. And <clears throat> uh, just as of uh, earlier this year, uh, a list of priority skill areas was was released by the government um, to say this is where we need to focus our attention. Um, when it gets to the, the, you asked about the RTOs, so registered, registered training organisations are those, uh, those um, uh, facil institutions that deliver the education. Um, they are a mix of publicly funded colleges, uh, private, private organisations uh, and industry groups. Um, they are uh, certified or accredited by a federal body um, known as uh, ASQA, the Australian Skills Quality Authority, um, which is responsible for ensuring that the what is being provided is uh, meets a certain standard, is nationally consistent, and um, uh, meets uh, a variety of criteria. Well, if I could just jump in, so again, you've got basically that um, level which establishes sort of a baseline in terms of quality and certification. Again, then that sort of flows down at the state level, uh, again, with employer input in terms of just the, you know, the... It, when it comes to individual courses, uh, we, what we call training packages. So those, those are designed with industry and to say, you know, this is, uh, for example, cybersecurity. Um, what, what, does it, what does it mean? What would a certificate three in cybersecurity meet, uh, need? So if I was to have a, to employ someone that is a cybersecurity specialist or a technician, what would I expect from them? And, and those expectations are uh, heavily provided for by, by industry. And for an individual who, again, goes through this process and, and obtains that certification, that certification is portable, right? Yes. I mean, that's something that um, they're not sort of um, tied to a specific employer or not region. Not to an employer, not to an individual state. So the Australian Qualification Framework, the AQF, sits above all of this and you have a, uh, a, a qualification which you can take from employer to employer, from state to state, and you can also use it to uh, contribute towards further education as well. So you can complete a certificate three, for example, with a bit more study that becomes a certificate four. Great, and again, I think that seems like you've wrestled with trying to strike the right balance, but at least maintaining a, a certifiable baseline. That and Thank I you. Back. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. Uh, now, Mr. Smucker, the ranking member, has decided to go at the end of uh, his members of questioning, so we're going to Mr. Rothman. Okay, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, of course, you're here today because I think we all agree that uh, in America, our 
education system after people graduate from high school is very inefficient and very screwed up. Um, at what age in each of your countries is an average person expected to be working in the profession in which he or she will be work for the rest of their life? I guess I'll put it that way. What, what is the expectation? We'll start with you, Mr. Bradley, and just work across. Uh, thank, for the, thank you for the question. I guess the answer to that is it depends on the, on the, um, the occupation that we're, we're talking about. I can tell you that uh, roughly of the, the 140,000 uh, apprentices that commenced a, an apprenticeship... And, and I'm just not saying apprentice. I'm looking for your country. Like in America, you could go to college to become a CPA. You could get an apprenticeship and become a, a pipe fitter or an operating engineer. Um, the, the problem in America is very few people begin to do those things at age 21 or 22. Too many of them farfel around for a while in life before they do what eventually will be their life's work. That's what I'm looking for. In your respective countries, subjectively, if, if you don't have the exact answer, when are people expected to be working full-time at the profession of their life? Uh, again, I really, so I guess you'd have an apprenticeship which would take about four years, so you're talking about 22 by the time you're starting a career. Same with a, a bachelor's degree, you're talking 21, 22, 23 maybe, before you're going on a profession like that. I don't know if the answer is occupation for life. That's probably where I'm, I'm tripping up on the question. I think we're in a state of the world now where we're starting one occupation, a bit more training, a bit more education, and we might pivot along, along the way through. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I can say for Germany that it's about the same age, so if you start your apprenticeship at about 18, 19, you might also be ready at uh, 21, 22, um, but um, the same thing um, occurs in Germany, like it m must not mean that you do this um, occupation for the rest of your life, so that's one um, major um, characteristic or criteria for our occupations, that we want to qualify people very broadly, so that they have flexibility within their sector and also towards other sectors, so that it's not like they have to stick in this one occupation, that's very narrow, the qualification that we offer, that's a major characteristic, so, and there is also continuing education Education, you can transfer to higher education, so it doesn't necessarily mean, for example, I started my apprenticeship also as a bank clerk, and now I'm sitting here, so it, yeah. it depends on what you're doing afterwards. Yes. Dr. Marty. Thank you. Yes, in, in Switzerland, apprentices usually graduate at age 19 and 20, and then they can really start uh, working in their, in their occupation. Is However, that the norm? I would say most of people who do an apprenticeship graduate at age 19 or 20, because typically they start around okay. 16, some start at age 15, some start at age 17, that's a little bit the range, and then the apprenticeships usually take three or four years, depending which occupation we're talking about. Okay. So they can start uh, working at uh, full time in, a, in, a, in their profession, at age 19 or 20, some okay. even at 80 maybe, some uh, in their early 20s. But, and that's also, I think, uh, a key feature of our system. They typically okay. do not stay there yep. for the rest of their life. They can go on into further education and... Okay, I, I wanna ask you, each, each of you, whether you have this problem in your country. In America, I think we have two huge problems connected with our traditional four universities. First of all, almost half, uh, do not graduate when they go down that path, which obviously is a problem. And secondly, we have a lot of people get a degree in a four-year university, and they find out they cannot get a, a satisfactory job with that four-year university, and they may start an apprenticeship at age 25 or 28. Do, do, could you comment whether you have those problems in your countries? And again, I'll start with Mr. Bradley. Uh, so yes, so my, my, my recollection is that our completion rates for a three or four year bachelor's degree are slightly higher than the US, but it's, I'm talking 60% rather than 50%. Um, and, but I can talk about graduate outcomes where I know 75, 85% of graduates uh, have employment within three months of completing their degree. 
So uh, for Germany, I can say that uh, more than 50% are entering this dual system and um, it's driven by a need of the company. So they have actual uh, places where they want to hire the people after they finish the apprenticeship. And in our system, like 95% of the apprenticeship get a job afterwards. And we have a lower participation in higher education. Now that we've changed um, the degrees that we also implemented bachelor and master degrees, that might change a little bit. So bachelor degrees are a little bit competitive to apprenticeships. Um, but so far, apprenticeships offer a really good um, career perspective and uh, almost secure employment afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Grothman. We're going to move to Ms. Janapal. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you so much to all of you for coming here. I have the great honor of having former ambassador to Switzerland, Susie Levine, is in my district. And so I have actually heard a lot about, particularly Switzerland, but all over um, Europe, the apprenticeship model, and I'm grateful that you all are here. We have a lot to learn from you. Um, just going to the question of higher education, can you just quickly tell me, just picking up from where my colleague left off, um, whether the higher education in your countries is paid for by the government? Dr. Marty? Excuse me, I didn't, I didn't understand higher the last Higher education, part. how much does higher education cost? Is, it, is the majority of the cost covered by the government or are the students covering that? So um, university level education usually costs about $700 per semester in terms of tuition for <laughs> research universities. I'm sorry, let me just, let me just cough a little bit into the microphone. $700 per semester. Okay. Right, for research universities and uh, University of Applied Science, I believe it might be a little bit higher, like a thousand per semester. Okay, but Doctor. overall, for the bachelor, it's it might be below seven thousand. Seven thousand dollars for okay. a bachelor, Dr. Annan. Yeah, I can say almost the same numbers for Germany. So okay, yeah. and Mr. Bradley. Uh, it's a bit more complicated. So it is a co-contribution co between the federal government and students. Um, the students' fees are subsidised. Um, by, by the government, uh, but they are, all students in Australia have access to an income contingent loan, which they, uh, is not required to, to be repaid until uh, students start earning a, a, above a certain threshold. So not required to be repaid even if, they're, if, even if they're taking a loan. So I just, I think that's an important point because when you look at completion rates, you also have to look at some of the factors that drive why students don't complete. Um, let me go to women's participation in apprenticeship programs has been something I've been looking very closely at. And in the United States, it's devastatingly low. Only about 7% of apprentices nationwide are women. Um, I think in Australia, it's 25% are women. In Germany, about 37% are women. So Dr. Annan, what strategies have been particularly successful in making apprenticeships more attractive or accessible to women? Um, I wouldn't um, even say that we have a big problem with uh, low participation of uh, females in apprenticeships. It depends on the occupation, though there are typical male-dominated occupations like manufacturing or construction, for example, and there are also um, occupations dominated by women like education and care and typical occupations like this. But we have um, programs like uh, called Girls' Day or Boys' Day where we try to um, promote um, gender neutral um, vocational choices and also companies have um, marketing concepts in place to attract um, more female apprentices especially in IT or sectors like this where they have a low participation of fem females so far. In the United States, um, registered apprenticeships provide standardization of pay and it actually limits the potential for wage discrimination based on gender. Can you explain how Germany's wage standardization system works and how that helps ensure equal pay for, for equal work? So I can speak for the apprentices and I think there is uh, equal pay for both genders um, and so um, the, the uh, payment for the apprentices is based on the collective wage agreement that is agreed upon um, by the social partners in each sector and besides um, there can also be recommendations by the chambers in place about the um, apprentice, um, what should be paid to the apprentices and so um, employers can a little bit undercut or exceed these payments but more or less it's in the same range, and it's about on average 850 euro um, yeah. per month what they get. Yeah, that's very helpful. I mean, I just think that standardization of pay is very, very important because it helps on that piece. Um, the wage progression piece is also important, and it's important that individuals who complete apprenticeships also have the opportunity to pursue a higher education degree if they so choose. Dr. Marty, you talked about no dead ends in the Swiss apprenticeship system. Could you speak about why that's so important? 
I think it's also very important for the image apprenticeship has because young people always know that they, they can do an apprenticeship and they know that afterwards they have a profession, they learned a profession, they can start working, but they would always have the opportunity to move on and go, go to university. So I think it clearly helps the image of the apprenticeship. Thank you. And what is the um, what is the minimum wage in in your countries? Out of curiosity, the median. Um, oh. Your m minimum wage. Uh, the minimum, we, minimum wage. Yeah. We don't have a legal minimum wage, to my knowledge. There because are only it's recommendations. set by a board, correct? Sorry. It's set by a board. Is that how it? I know that there are recommendations, but I I don't think they're legally binding. But I'm. And not do you sure. have a sense? Of what is the? I can finish it by the profession. You, you usually. Uh, Earn, I would say, around four thousand dollars per month. Four thousand dollars a month per month yeah. after an apprenticeship. I would say, in average, like in the apprenticeship field, uh, I was. I think it was a little bit higher, but that was twenty years ago. <laughs> so but that would be forty-eight thousand dollars a year. A fifteen-dollar minimum wage yeah. would only be thirty thousand. This would be forty. It depends really dollars. which occupation we're talking yeah. about. It can go higher. Great. It can be a <coughs> Thank you less. so much. I Thank you, Ms. Janova. Thank you, Mr. Fonick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Annan, in your testimony, you mentioned that the graduation rate of apprenticeship programs is higher than that of students in traditional higher education. Low completion rates is something that, it's an issue that we're facing in this country that we're trying to improve upon. What do you think are the major reasons that we see a higher graduation rate among these, uh, in these apprenticeship programs? Um, I think it's, it depends on the individual, of course, um, but I think um, there is a high motivation, so you're very much involved in the um, everyday business in the company, and the company has a big interest that um, they complete the apprenticeship successfully. So they, I think that there are a, a lot of people around the apprentice who take care of, and there is a lot of monitoring, there is this intermediate uh, examination when they see how well they are doing in the apprenticeship, and afterwards when they are not doing very well, there are some adjustment measures in place, so the um, companies try to take care of that, that the apprentice actually reaches the aim of the apprenticeship. And I think in higher education, it depends if you're in a university or in a university of applied science, but there is less um, people who actually take care and who um, monitor the success of the students. So I think that's one element, um, what I would say makes it more successful, that the completion rate is higher. Thank you. Mr. Bradley, in your testimony, you mentioned that the length of time to complete an apprenticeship is determined through a competency-based progression. How does this approach, instead of mandating a specific one-size-fits-all length of time, how does that benefit students who are deciding to change pathways or begin a program after already gaining experience in the workforce? So again, uh, so depending on the occupation, I guess what we're looking at is um, it's not a duration that kind of qualifies you to undertake to, to be a, uh, a technician, tradesperson, whatever, but it's how, how well skilled are you. So the training packages that are developed um, in consultation with industry reflect that. And it's, this is what we need, this is what's required, so this is roughly how long it takes. Um, I, I'd probably answer that question by going back to the qualifications framework where <clears throat> the amount of study that you do will qualify you for a... A um, uh, qualification up to a certain level, so maybe a certificate two, certificate three. If you choose to leave early and you've done a, an amount of study, six months a year, uh, and that qualifies you for one of the, the lower qualifications, even though you're stretching for a higher one, you'll still be able to walk away with that, at least walk, the, walk away with something. Thank you. I yield the balance of my time to the ranking member of the full committee, Dr. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Fonick. I, I want to build a little bit on uh, some comments that were just made. Um, a persistent problem we have with the apprenticeship system in the United States is the disappointing stigma attached to models other than what we have known as, quote, traditional post-secondary education at a college or university. Despite the consistent evidence of success for participants, there still seems to be a hesitance on the part of some to enter into apprenticeship programs. I've spent years trying to combat this stigma and championing the idea that all education is career education. And to build on um, the comment about what has been done to change the attitude, what factors do you think have led to the success you've experienced in building a culture where apprenticeships are such an integral and accepted component of education? And if each of you would answer that briefly, uh, we have one and a quarter minute. 
just real quick. So um, I guess there's two things that I'll point to, and thank you for the question. Two things that I'll, I'll point to. One is the, uh, the Australian Apprenticeships Ambassadors Program, um, which has recruited prominent Australians, particularly from, from uh, different sports fields, so from the National Rugby League, for example, or the Australian Football League, who have come up through the, the vocational um, or apprenticeship uh, ranks themselves, who now act out in the community and say, this is what I've done, this is how I learned, this is where I've gotten to, and what a wonderful idea that was. Uh, that's one. The other thing I'll, I'll point to was a joint campaign between <coughs> the industry body that represent our, represents our uh, technical colleges um, and our higher uh, our research uh, universities, the group of eight, um, who came out together. So you had the community colleges and the research universities who came out together and said um, that there needs to be a seamless pathway between, for, from vocational training to higher education and to, to research. These sectors are, are working together. Thank you. Um, I think for Germany, I can say that um, the companies themselves, they train the people, the apprenticeships, and so they trust what they do themselves, and they have developed the training standards, so they also know that it's adjusted to what their needs, needs, what they don't know necessarily about higher education. So, of course, they need also um, graduates from higher education, but for the apprenticeship, there's just a high transparency. So they know what's in it, they know the standard, they developed it, and they know how it's trained, so they trust the result and the outcomes, and that's why they want to hire the people and that's why it's kind of successful. I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and let Dr. Marty finish your question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, yeah I think the, the success actually speaks to, to a certain, to a certain uh, degree for, for itself, but also what, what we did, we streamlined, streamlined the permeability uh, within our overall education system and I think that's, that contributed a lot to the, to the image. Uh, also of the apprenticeship system, but also the fact that the apprenticeship model takes place in a dual way, like pra practice and education in a, in a, in a school, uh, has a stimulating effect on, on many young people because, because they know why they learn that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Fox. Uh, Mr. Takano. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Davis, uh, for this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses uh, for providing your insight into this growing industry in your respective countries. Um, these international models uh, provide great um, examples of what successful and high quality apprenticeship programs look like. While we have some successful registered apprenticeships in a few of our states here in America, we also have a lot to learn from you all on how to implement um, our apprenticeships on a larger scale. Uh, the Trump administration established a task force to study apprenticeships, and while it recommended that there are apprenticeship opportunities in every high school in America, there has not been a clear plan on how to make this happen. So here's a question I have for every one of you. What specific steps, um, what are the specific steps uh, your countries have taken to lead such high participation in apprenticeships while students are still in school? Um, starting with Mr. Bradley. So I think the answer to that question is to say there's a holistic view here. So one, we have wanted to bring in um, uh, flexibility, uh, local industry, local knowledge into the design of, of different courses and different apprenticeships. So that flexibility and that kind of input from industry I think has been very, very important. At the same time, um, you need to have the quality assurance that sits on top. So we have, uh, we have a, a national regulator that sits a, across across our vocational sector to uh, ensure that certain competency standards are met and um, the student experience is, is, uh, is a positive one. Um, our quality assurance um, bodies, we have one for the vocational sector and one for, for higher education. It's a bit more than just um, what is taught and what is, what is specifically being offered as part of a degree or as part of a, a certificate or diploma course. Um, but they also go into questions about sexual assault on campus, freedom of speech. What is the old, ultimate student experience like when you're, as you're undertaking this course? Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Alman? Um, 
Yeah, I think in Germany, um, after you finished your um, full-time compulsory education, you've got the choice of uh, three more years of compulsory part-time education that can be vocational or general education. So it gives um, students, young people, the choice. Um, they can choose if they want to um, go to more towards a vocational track or more a general track, but they afterwards still have the opportunities to go into higher education, to go into an apprenticeship. And um, yeah, I think that's why the participation in the system is that high. And I think it's a lot about the reputation that uh, dual bath has in Germany. So um, after, even if you complete your A-level, it's an opportunity for people to um, build a good career on this. And of course, um, so they're not having to choose between going to an apprenticeship and also being able to afford uh, a regular higher education. It sounds like it's very affordable in Germany. Yeah, I, th I think both opportunities are very affordable, so I don't think that the financial aspect is a big um, criteria for young people. So in the apprenticeship, they get paid from the companies. In higher education, as you've heard from both of us, it's not like they have to pay high tuition. Um, but I think the reputation of uh, vocational training is um, very high in Germany, so that it's not like you do this vocational training, and as, as have been asked before, you end up in the occupation for the rest of your life. It offers a broad... Um, variety of opportunities afterwards. Dr. Marty? Yeah, I think it's similar. Um, the apprenticeship pathways are just seen as, as very relevant. And as, as we have um, apprenticeships in 230 different fields, there is something for everyone in a way. Because in, in school, you measure uh, success with grades. And uh, in an apprenticeship, and yeah, you have a few subjects, but apprenticeships, it can be so many different things. You can be a music instrument builder, you can do an apprenticeship in banking, in a, in a, in a lab technician, construction worker, chef, so many fields. So there is almost something, probably something for everyone, and I think that attracts people. And that's why we have a consistent, uh, quite consistent percentage of a little bit more than two thirds of an age cohort going into apprenticeship. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bradley, in your testimony, you noted that the Australian, uh, that Australia provides an incentive of about $4,000 to employers at the time of completion of the program, as well as special incentives. Is that an amount per apprentice or per year? Uh, one is up to 4000 I should make that clear. Uh, it is, uh, there, there are payments paid to the employer upon commencement and completion. So, but is that per student, or is that just to, to be an uh, to be? No, that's uh, per apprentice. Per apprentice. Yes. So they get four thousand dollars per year per apprentice. The my understanding oh, is or per, per completion. My understanding is that the the uh, employer will, re will receive a payment for taking on a, an apprentice, and once they complete the apprenticeship as well. Per that's person. per apprentice. That's amazing. I yield back to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Cox. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and. Uh, a minute ago, I just jumped into my question, and I want to say thank you all to uh, being here today and sharing your expertise with us and um, helping us better understand uh, the programs that you have uh, operating. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, Dr. Marti, I appreciate your discussion of the public-private partnership in Switzerland's apprenticeship model, and I know some of my colleagues were able to visit there, I was not, and the role of employers in designing and updating programs. I agree this is absolutely vital to ensuring students have the skills necessary to be competitive in the labor market. So tell us what you've done in Switzerland to integrate the apprenticeship system with the needs of employers and why this is important. The employers are really in the driver's seat when it comes to designing the curricula of the apprenticeship. Like whatever happens on the, in, in the work streams where, where apprentices learn in a company or with any employer, uh, those needs are defined by the employers. The federal government, however, of course, reviews those curricula in order to make sure that they are consistent and consistent for a profession but the definition of the needs is coming from the employers. And uh, I'm assuming that some of this has to do with the labor market. Uh, do you make adjustments in the slots that are available? I'm sure employers must do that. Does the government have any role in playing, in deciding, look, 
we can look down the road and we know we're going to have X positions empty. No. The government does monitor it, but it's, it's a free market. Currently, the, this market works uh, in favor of the apprentices because there are many more open positions than there are young people entering apprentices. The reason is just demographically. Uh, we had the opposite in the late 90s uh, until about 2010, where we had too few apprenticeship positions. Then the government um, uh, like, uh, was talking to the, to, to the employers to, to incentivize them to, uh, to uh, offer more apprenticeship positions, but not with subsidies. So it's a little bit an up and, and down. Now we, we, we see stronger age cohorts coming up. So in 10 years time, I think the market might be a little bit different than now. But then again, we might also have new apprenticeship uh, uh, fields. It's, it's really a market. I think it's really important what you said before about there are 230 fields. I think in the United States, apprenticeships have been almost always thought about as being in the construction area. And that's been one of the things I have been talking about for a long time, too, is we need earn while you learn programs. I don't care what you call them, apprenticeships or whatever, but earn while you learn programs. Um, I'd like to ask you another question, Dr. Marti. Given how young Swiss students start their apprenticeships, could you talk more about how students determine what apprenticeship they want to pursue? Thank you, yeah. Yeah, so they usually start at age 14, 15, around that time, the, the second and last year of compulsory education that ends around 15, 16, depending when they're born in the year. So during the last two years, it's quite an intense, intensive uh, process. Usually the homeroom teacher is, is reserving one lesson per week to overviews on what is possible. They would visit the career um, counseling center, which is a kind of a regional infrastructure in Switzerland. Every region has, has one. Where they can where they can go go for counselling, like on an individual level in the classroom, it's class wide, and there is also an individual level. But employers, companies, they do also a lot. So they offer uh, job shadowings. You can go there and and uh, try out whether that's something that you would interest would be interested in. So there is quite a lot going on in that way. Yeah. I want to go back to something that was said earlier, and I'm going to ask you all for. A, a set of numbers about, we compare all the time what people earn by getting a baccalaureate and not getting a baccalaureate. And I'd like to ask you all, not now, but I will submit questions to you about apprenticeships versus high, higher ed. But I wanna ask you about, really quickly, this figure you gave about $7,000 total for a baccalaureate degree, that does not count uh, housing, that does not count food, any of those auxiliary expenses, right? Uh, well, in, in Germany, um, basically what you pay for the institution is almost nothing. You pay for the services of the university and you pay for your housing and stuff, but there are, are also subsidies by the government, so you can get uh, grants and you can also uh, get money from the government um, and that supports you, so. Otherwise. Okay. Yeah. You will fi we'll f Finish that up in another. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Up. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you, Chair Davis and Ranking Member Smucker, and thank you to our witnesses. I'm glad we're having this hearing today to learn about successful policies that can help people access better paying jobs and meet the demands of our local employers. I often talk about having a path for everyone, uh, and not everyone's on the same path, and we have to have those opportunities. And in my home state of Oregon, we're fortunate to have numerous examples of strong registered apprenticeship programs that include the quality training, portable credentials, high wages, and a pathway to a permanent job. And one example, we have the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center, also known as OMIC. Uh, they're bringing together industry leaders in advanced manufacturing with local co colleges to develop a registered apprenticeship program to complement uh, the advanced manufacturing facilities, actually based off a model in Sheffield, England. And this, this is a collaboration that's gonna provide growth, innovation, and efficiency in advanced manufacturing, plus a more skilled workforce. It's a tremendous opportunity for Oregonians and the type of partnership, I think, that, that we're looking for. And as we evaluate ways to expand registered apprenticeship programs in the United States to new sectors of the economy, 
beyond manufacturing and building trades, we have an opportunity to learn a lot from what you're doing and your uh, robust support for um, apprenticeship programs. Mr. Bradley, I wanted to ask you, do Australia's registered training organizations provide uh, apprenticeship, apprentices with the wraparound services, for example, childcare, transportation, mentoring, uniforms or work attire, tools, and how, if so, does the inclusion of these support services affect the success and retention of the apprentices? Thank you for the question. So, uh, so part of, part of the program, you will have access to uh, what's called the Australian Apprenticeship Support Network, which provides that kind of more pastoral care, mentorship, industry-specific mentorship along throughout the, 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 the component of the... Uh, of the apprenticeship, um, uh, you will have access in uh, certain occupations, you'll have access to an income contingent loan, uh, which will allow you to do those upfront purchases if you have to buy tools, uniforms, whatever it is, those kind of additional living costs to begin your, your apprenticeship as well, um, up to around $21,000, which I think is, is rather sizable. Um, beyond that, Child, you mentioned childcare, transportation. Um, I, childcare, I want to say, will be a private service. I don't think there is a specific program or facility to provide that. And then transportation, I think it will vary from state to state whether or not you're classified or treated in the same way as, as, as a university student or a college student while you're doing your apprenticeship as well, whether or not you get a, a concession. Yeah, thank you. We found that oftentimes those can be barriers to people actually completing an apprenticeship. And then I wanted to ask each of you, um, how do your country systems engage with stakeholders, with the employers, with labor unions, with apprentices, with localities, in developing your programs, and have these partnerships allowed you to expand programs to new occupations or sectors? Dr. Annan? Um, so I think the main characteristic of our system that is it's consensus-based. So we have all the stakeholders together at the table. Um, once we start the idea of creating a new apprenticeship or a new occupation, or if we are updating one, so it's all they come together and they have to agree, agree upon the standard that we want to set. So it's like um, this consensus principle is something that is very dominant in our system, I guess. Thank you, Dr. Murdy. Um, how do you engage stakeholders and have you been able to expand to new occupations or sectors? It is a bottom-up process. So usually it's the employers who, who start talking to, to their professional organization they're a member of. And this, these professional organizations, they aggregate that and then they talk to the government, to the federal government. And the federal government would formally decide to, to start a commission where all the partners, probably similar as what you said, would be involved, also the cantons, the, the employers via the professional organizations and the federal government. And Mr. Bradley, how, how do you engage stakeholders and have you been able to expand to new occupations or sectors? Sure. So, I think, so I think industry input is an important part of the apprenticeship program as well, um, not just in terms of uh, identifying new programs, but input into the training packages, the competencies, what qualifies as, uh, and so on. Um, uh, it's a rather flexible system, I'll say. Uh, there's over 500 occupational pathways through the apprenticeship and traineeships that are on offer. There's it's being expanded into new digital fields, advanced manufacturing, industry 4.0, uh, cybersecurity, <laughs> and so on as well. Terrific, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair and the Ranking Member. I want to thank you as well. I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I want to follow on the great questions of Ms. Bonamici, uh, talking about the great work that Oregon is doing. It sounds like some exciting things are happening out there. Virginia is also uh, doing some great things with job training programs and has, I get to brag a little bit, CNBC just came out with their top states uh, to do business, and Virginia was once again number one. So uh, we're doing some great innovative things in Virginia. Um, and, and part of that is because uh, we have that flexibility, and I want to actually point out that the administration is uh, following up on that by uh, 
trying to remove some of the top-down administration of these apprenticeship programs, the task force on apprenticeship expansion uh, recommended the creation of a new recognition for apprenticeship programs that choose not to register with the Department of Labor, known as the Industry Recognized Apprenticeship Program, IRAP. These apprenticeships will be overseen by third parties that may include trade and industry groups, companies, nonprofits, unions, and joint labor management organizations. Uh, they're complementing these federally registered apprenticeships, but they're not held back by the same bureaucratic restraints that prevent flexibility in program requirements uh, that's crucial to meeting the varying needs of differing different industries. And I would argue that the industries that are present in Virginia are often different than the industries that are present in a state like Oregon. So you need that flexibility to be able to uh, adjust and update. So I know that um, you all are, are managing these programs in your own countries on a smaller scale, but when it comes to uh, the autonomy of your localities to adjust, uh, do your localities have that autonomy? Are they able to adapt, or is it more of a top-down model where you have to go to the uh, to the entity that is regulating on a national level to get that adjustment made? Uh, let me start with Mr. Uh, well, let me start with Dr. Annan. So I think uh, the magic word in Germany is that our training standards are a minimum standard. So we agree upon something that is always contained in the certificate once you finish your apprenticeship. And besides this, we've got a, a lot of flexibility for the companies. They can actually um, add um, contents to it. They can adjust um, the things towards their um, company-based needs. And also, um, we try to do our standards, which are company and technology neutral, so that it means that it's on a very um, abstract level how we um, try to establish those standards, that it leaves the flexibility that the companies need. And also, we are do, uh, reforming our training regulations every five to 10 years. So within that time, of course, um, companies have the flexibility to adjust their training towards the actual needs. But what we have in our training regulation is the minimum standard that every company can rely on once you hire an apprenticeship in this occupation that at least they have what the content of this standard is. Thank you. Dr. Mar Marty. Thank you. Yeah, it is similar. Um, you can always do more than what is uh, regulated, but for each occupation it is valid uh, federally, like nationwide. So, so uh, the minimum standards are, are, are really nationwide valid. What percent of your education budget is funded nationally? Do you, do you fund it, is it administered? Like for the apprenticeship uh, system, it is, um, it's, it's nine billion in total, about five, 5.2 is from, from the employers, 60%, right. and about 3.6 3 is from the cantons and the... Uh, but even uh, your secondary school system, is that administered federally or is that locally? No, that is, that is uh, cantonal and, lo cantonal and locally. And locally, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Bradley, what about the flexibility uh, for your regions? So I think there was a good way to phrase it as well as a, it, it, it provides a minimum standard in the system. Um, I think what's important is that we have a nat nationally recognized qualification, it's market orientated, quality assured, stackable, portable. Uh, we've just completed a rather significant review of our vocational education sector, uh, the Joyce Review. Uh, and that has been all about how do we strengthen quality assurance, speed up the qualification development, provide um, simpler pathways to getting new apprenticeships uh, up and running. And there's a task force that's been established to implement those changes. In 2016, you all committed to the new alternative delivery pilots for apprenticeships with the aim of increasing promotion and growth of apprenticeships. What, what results have you seen from these pilots? Uh, I can't comment on the specific program. At a macro level, our... Um, uh, the number of apprenticeships and numbers commencing have been has been relatively stable. So there's been a halt of a, a overarching decline over a couple of decades, but it's been relatively stable for the last, say, five years. Um, but for a pilot program, I think it's going to be pilot specific, small. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member Smucker, as well. Uh, thank you for convening this hearing, and to our witnesses, thank you for your testimony. I want to congratulate uh, you all for the successful programs that you oversee in your respective uh, countries. And uh, particularly, uh, I want to recognize Dr. Marty, uh, the Max uh, Datewire Company, a Swiss entity founded an apprenticeship program in, in my district in North Carolina named Apprenticeship 2000. 
uh, folks at Central Piedmont Community College rave about it as the students uh, complete associate degrees in uh, uh, mechatronics as well as journeyman certificate uh, from North Carolina and allows them to immediately uh, work in a technical field, uh, including some at Date Waller itself. So thank you, Dr. Marty, for your work, as, as well as the work of the Swiss companies that have subsidiaries in the U.S. With that, I want to ask all three of you about how employers in your home countries are investing in your respective apprenticeship programs. Uh, I was happy to see that your models included the requirement of contracts between employers and apprentices, similar to our registered apprenticeship system in the U.S. Dr. Marty, why is this contract so important and what assurances does the contract provide uh, to both the employers and the apprentices in your system? Thank you. Yeah, the contract between the, the employer and, and the apprentice regulates the duration of the apprenticeship, the, of course the, the occupation, the salary, uh, the young apprentices get, which is a very modest salary, it's, it's really small, but it's seen as, a, as, a, as education primarily. And um, so because the apprentices are typically very young, uh, this contract needs to be signed also by, by a parent. Okay. Yeah, they sign it together. And on the other hand, of course, the employer. Great. Thank you. Dr. Annan, uh, I also noticed that there are requirements for wage progression as the apprentice's skills and uh, competencies increase. So why is this wage progression so important for the system? Um, I think of the, over the training time, so we've done a couple of analysis in my institute and I'm happy to send you the concrete numbers afterwards, but um, the, the net cost that an apprenticeship costs the company is on average 11,000 euro and that is subtracting um, the um, benefits that they get from the productive apprentice and of course the apprentice gets more productive over the training period. So, um, and it also depends from occupation to occupation, it differs, um, because in some occupations, even the um, benefits um, exaggerate the costs that the companies um, invest in the apprenticeships. So it depends on the occupation, and um, in general, the investment is very low in comparison to having a well-skilled and um, adjusted towards your company needs a trained apprenticeship at the end of those three years. Oh, okay. Dr. Marty, uh, can you tell me how the funds within your apprenticeship systems uh, are distributed and how much is spent at the federal level, the state level, and what are the investments in the education system? Of the overall, um, 9 billion, about 5.2 are coming from the employers, and they are used to pay the salaries of, of the apprentices and also to pay the instructors, mainly, and uh, the the money that comes from the cantons, which is a little bit less than, than three billion, uh, is, is used to, to pay the vocational schools, the teachers in the cantons, because each canton has vocational schools, so there is also an infrastructure of vocational schools across the country, and if an employer likes to start an apprenticeship, the school is already there. And, and the federal government is investing, and I think that's interesting, they, also, they invest also in, in pilots, Mm -hmm. to further develop uh, the program, to try out new, new things. And, um, and uh, also, also is commissioning research into the system, mm -hmm. into specific aspects of the system, uh, in order to, to gather information for an evidence-based uh, reform, for instance. So what, what are the percentages in terms of uh, expended, uh, the state versus the federal? So yeah, it's, it's uh, three quarters of the public funding. Three quarters comes from the cantons, our states, mm -hmm. and, uh, and just a quarter uh, from the federal government. Overall, it's 10% from the federal government when you include the whole um, budget, including what the employers contribute. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Walker? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I. Uh, I have enjoyed my time in Australia, Dr. Bradley, uh, in Sydney, uh, Alice Springs, in Darwin. Of course, I did, I did heed warning of the crocodiles there on the Darwin Beach and made sure I was staying far clear from that. Uh, I do have a, a couple questions there for uh, Dr. Marty, if I could start. Uh, I'll be introducing legislation to highlight the importance of expanding access to apprenticeships for high school students and other populations. As you know, the Switzerland Apprenticeship Program is available to students beginning, I believe it's the age 16. 
Uh, can you speak to the additional value added to students' long-term workforce development when they have access to apprenticeships at an earlier age? I, I'm not sure whether I understood it correctly. At even an earlier age than 16? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in some cases, uh, apprentices start at age 15. It depends when they were born in the year, sometimes, sometimes when they graduate from compulsory school after uh, nine, like two kindergarten years and nine school years, uh, they would start at age 15 and that's, that just works. That's, that's, that's no problem. I, I'm not aware of younger than 15. Yeah. But in, thank you. In, in looking through your testimony, was I correct to see that 90% of the funding for said apprenticeships comes from the private sector or from employers and, uh, and, uh, and about 10% contributed from the federal government? Is that, are those numbers correct? No, it's 60% it's, it's from the employers and 30% from the cantons and 10% from the federal government. All right, it, it, can you give me a, a 20 second description of the cantons, make sure that for people that are listening or watching, they understand what that is? Sorry? The cantons, C-A-N-T-O-N-S, can you explain what those are? Are those employers as well? Can you explain? The cantons? Uh, sorry, yes. the, the cantons is basically the equivalent of a state here in the United States. Yes, yeah. right, it's, okay. It's Making uh, sure people were, yeah, were clear on the yes. uh, Based on these funding proportions, would you say that the private industry investment in Switzerland's workforce development is equal to, if not more beneficial, than simply increasing the federal government's role in the apprenticeship program? So place the value of the importance. Who's, what's more important here? I think it's, it's, it's a win-win situation. I mean, the employers really have a big interest uh, in investing in apprenticeship because, because that's their future workforce. But and that is also very in interesting to see. It is actually beneficial for them to, to uh, start apprenticeship programs already during the apprenticeship. So they invest a little bit more than five billion uh, US dollars per, per year, all employers together in Switzerland. Um, but they get uh, ab about, 5.6, 5 5.7 5 uh, billion out. So they get a good return is what you're yeah. saying. So yes. it's, it's almost more than on the stock market. Thank you for that. I'd like to uh, yield my last two minutes to uh, Representative Virginia Fox. Um, thank you, Mr. Walker. I appreciate that. Uh, you all have alluded to and, and spoken directly both to the fact that employers are very engaged in what's going on. Dr. Annan, um, you said that companies deliver 70% of the education that's in the system. Um, you also said a few minutes ago that there are minimum standards set by the federal government and then employers can change throughout the year. Is that correct, what you said? To meet the needs of the changing economy, the technology, those things. Exactly. So uh, the biggest part of the training is provided by the companies. So uh, comparable to Switzerland, it's like either three days or something in company and two or one day at school. And um, of course, employers have the flexibility. They can always add more training, more competencies. This is, as I said before, it's a minimum standard to make sure that this is at least um, guaranteed once you get the certificate at the end. And this is what is also contained in the final examination. But um, it, it depends really on the on the branch or on the sector. We've got some occupations who have a very quick turnover where we um, reform them every three or four years sometimes or five years. Um, so it depends on the dynamics of the sector. Um, and sometimes, as you said, also for Switzerland, they turn to the ministry and they are like, okay, we need uh, to adjust the training regulation and we can't work with this any longer. But in the meantime, they have this flexibility for sure to, to do more training or to do it um, according to the innovative standards in the sector. Real quick question, Dr. Marti. You mentioned 230 fields where there are apprenticeships. Do you have an idea how many new fields have come in in the last 20 years because of changes in technology? It's difficult in, in, in terms of changes in, in technology, but I think mainly in the IT field. <clears throat> I, I don't know a, an actual number, but what, what we also did, we we integrated the healthcare, social care, um, and arts fields into the regular apprenticeship system in the early 2000s, but they already existed before. So this was more a streamlining of the overall system. But I would say it's mainly in the, in the IT field, like me media medician or, or uh, ICT technician. I think those were probably the fields that were most 
I thought that might be the Thank case. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harder. Uh, thank you, Chairman Davis. Uh, I represent California's 10th congressional district in the California Central Valley. And what I've noticed in our community is there are a lot of seeds of apprenticeship programs that are successful, but they haven't quite grown into the trees that you have in Switzerland or, or, or Germany. We have sort of the beginnings of a model. Uh, there's a couple that I have toured that I, I really admire, the National Agricultural Science Center in, in, in Modesto, uh, Volt, which basically helps train people in the construction industry and as apprentice uh, uh, mechanics and, and all the rest. One of the things that I think I'd love to really dive into is how you got the buy-in both from the government entities as well as from the employers themselves to invest such a significant amount in the apprenticeship industry. Because I view uh, you know, our model as we know what works, we just haven't really scaled it up in a lot of our, a lot of our communities. Uh, Dr. Ann, and I'd love to start with you. Can you speak to the support of, of employers in particular? And how, are, how do you view the German model as successful in getting employer buy-in at such a large scale, $28 billion or more? Um, I would say that in our country, the, the companies realize that in, it is in their own best interest. So they need the skilled workers and they need the ones that have exactly the skills that they need in the workplace. And with the training, the vocational training, that's one of the best things, how they can make sure that they have this workforce. And we need skilled workers especially. I mean, we have a demand in a variety of, we also need um, higher educational qualified people, but I think we've got a big need, especially for skilled workers in a lot of fields. And I think our companies have realized that this is um, a good chance for them to actually provide these people for themselves and to train them exactly adjusted towards their needs. And so they've got a high motivation. It's in their own best interest, I think. And for the government as well, I mean, it's um, the, uh, if I may quote Kennedy here, there's nothing more expensive uh, than uh, education, which is no education. So if you don't educate the people afterwards, you have way more cost uh, when the people get unemployed. So that's why it's also in, in the interest of the government to invest in education to make sure that people get an employment afterwards. Thank you. And uh, just to build off uh, Chairwoman Fox's question around new occupations. So I, my understanding is there's about 327 recognized occupations in Germany. What happens when there's a new occupation that is added? How do you build employer buy-in for that? Um, so first, we try to make sure we often do research in advance and we ask, we do um, surveys and ask if there is really a need. And we also make sure that's a long-term need, that it's not something that's just a short-term demand, which can be maybe uh, regulated in a different way than having a uh, training occupation. And we also want to make sure that it's a broad qualification which is needed um, over time. So that's what we try to make sure. And then. Um, we, when we implement it, we also have everybody um, on board for it. And there is a lot of marketing from the chambers, from the umbrella organizations of the employers, from the trade unions. So they all try to promote this um, occupation. And we, we really check this um, very seriously before we um, try to establish a new training occupation to make sure that there is a need in the labor market. So once Thank we you. do that, it is clear that there is a need. Thank you. I appreciate that. Dr. Marti, a question about the, the Swiss model. The other component here that I think is really important is the seamlessness uh, of these models, where you're actually able to start as an apprentice and go on and, and earn a PhD uh, like, like yourself. Uh, can you speak to the importance of a nationally portable credential that apprentices earn at the completion of their, of their degree? Can you share why you feel like that's been successful and, and, and how exactly that works? I think a, a portable degree is very important for, for the apprentices, of course, because t so they can work nationwide and, and also every employer in the country knows, an employer in Zurich knows when he, see, he or she sees an, a credential from Geneva what it is. And um, for the seamlessness of uh, moving into other pathways, it it's still, of course, uh, depends a lot on the interest and aptitude of, of the young people. It's not that, that somehow you, you're obliged to, to, to move on, but, but still a, a large percentage of people do it because of their interest and, yeah. and aptitude. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I think uh, the testimony that I've heard today has really confirmed the importance of apprenticeship programs to making sure that there's more routes to the middle class than just having a, a four-year degree here. And I think the, the, the next steps are for us to make sure we can understand how to increase investments 
towards these apprenticeship programs, how we can create some of those seamless certification programs that have been successful in Switzerland and in Germany, and, and how to really make sure that we're bringing on our business and industry community to have some skin in the game as well. So thank you so much for all your time, and I yield back the remainder. Thank you very much. Mr. Timmons? Thank you, Madam Chair Chairwoman. Thank you uh, to each of our witnesses today. Um, I'm going to give you my personal experience with apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeships. So I own two businesses, a CrossFit gym and a yoga studio. And both of them have an onboarding process to get new coaches. Um, instructors in the yoga studio, coaches in the gym are incredibly important and it takes years to hone your skill and you just don't start out that way. So in the gym, for example, we pay uh, $15 an hour. We currently have three people in the apprentice. We don't call it that. It's a coach uh, development program. and it, after a few months, they can then become coaches, and uh, we could hire them on full time. And so we have that, and it's, it's worked fantastic. We have developed a lot of great coaches. Um, I personally have been through two uh, apprenticeship programs, um, not as in the formal sense, but uh, I was in law school, and I wanted to learn more about the courtroom. I wanted to see lawyers at work, so I went to a judge, and I said, I would like to shadow you. I would like to be with you for as long as you would let me. And so I did that for a few months and learned a great deal. That was unpaid. And then I went, uh, I wanted to be a prosecutor. So I went to the solicitor and I said, our, our district attorney, and I said, um, I really want to be a prosecutor. I'm, I appreciate that I need, I have a lot I need to learn. And so I went and I uh, ended up working there. Um, I was paid very little. I worked there for eight months before he hired me on uh, full time. So it was great. I mean, I've had a lot of uh, benefits to these programs where you uh, learn skills, you develop them to be as um, competitive as possible in the labor market. So interestingly, none of those had anything to do with the government. Um, they, there was no federal money, there was no state money. My business just does it because it's, it's, it's best practice. So I guess my question is, how do you in your countries uh, find people for these programs. So uh, I've never had any assistance. I just saw something I wanted to do, and then I found a way to get the skills to do it. So when someone is in uh, Switzerland, how, how do they pick? How, how, how do they find themselves in a, in a program? And a, a young apprentice, you mean, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really during the last two years of, of compulsory school that they, that they start to look into possibilities. And on the other hand, and it's, this is really why it is a market, uh, the employers, they want to have the people with the best aptitude for their field. So they also develop, for instance, tests. You need, often the employers, they would ask you to try to pass a test, an exam in their field before they would consider hiring you. So when you're in school, the, uh, the, the counselor school. just says, you have paths now, and what do you want to do? And you take a test, and then you find the best fit? You, uh, you usually do that already before you graduate. Like in your last year, uh, of, like you sign the apprenticeship contract usually in your last year of compulsory school. And before you can sign that contract with the employer, the employer usually um, asks you to take a test that is typically, or in many cases, uh, developed by the company itself. I believe what? smaller companies, they, they share tests that are developed by other entities, but larger companies, they develop their own exams. So is it government run or is it business run? Does the market dictate the outcome or does the government dictate the outcome? Those, those exams are, are uh, and, and also the decision to hire an apprenticeship, that's, that's the decision of the employer. And of course, we have public and private employers um, a ministry in Switzerland typically also trains apprentices. Uh, a public hospital would train apprentices. Uh, a public university would also train apprentices. And, but primarily it's private, so private sector. If you're a doctor, we, we have what is essentially an apprentice program. Uh, after you graduate medical school, you have to go and um, serve in a learning capacity first. So is, it, is that called an apprentice program as well, or is it different for professional degrees? Like residency? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's it's in the higher. That's in the higher ed uh, part of our education system. But you're right in a way. Or, yeah, it is. It is also dual in in the sense that it's practical after theoretical studies. But it's clearly not in the apprenticeship uh, system to be a medical doctor. But a nurse, for instance, uh, that's a, that's an apprenticeship. 
do the, the other two witnesses, um, similar last two years of uh, compulsory school, you are driven into uh, one of these programs or further education, is that yeah, you, you, you look exactly what, what, what uh, fits you, and then you would start uh, a, a healthcare uh, worker apprenticeship after graduating from compulsory school, exactly. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman Scott. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanna thank all of our witnesses. This is some very good information and will help us in our work uh, designing apprenticeship programs um, let me ask you a qu first question. I don't know who this is aimed at, but n normally you would graduate from high school in America around age 18. Is that the case in your countries? I think in Germany, um, compulsory full-time education is nine to 10 years, so you're around 15, and then it's another three years of compulsory part-time education, and then you can do, if you're at a grammar school, for example, you can do your A-level, or if you're in a vocational school, um, it depends which school you choose afterwards, but it's, well, it's the standard. If you, if you uh, join, if you sign up for an apprenticeship, do you lose any of your ha otherwise available high school education? Sorry, if, if you, what, can you repeat? If you, if you sign up for an apprenticeship, is that in lieu of completing your high school education or in addition to your high school education? So if you, if you sign up for an apprenticeship, you need to have fulfilled the nine to 10 years of full-time education and afterwards when you sign up for an apprenticeship, you go to vocational school 30% of the time and that is your compulsory part-time education. So you are, you're doing this while you do the apprenticeship. You're fulfilling your part-time compulsory education during the three years of training. So that you would, you would get a high school, I don't, do you get a high school diploma at the end of your high school? So after an apprenticeship, you get three certificates. You get one from the chamber, which is the official recognized um, certificate. You get one certificate from the company, which tells the people how you performed in the workplace. Um, and you get one certificate from the vocational school, how you did in this vocational subject and the general subject. So you have three certificates at the end of an apprenticeship, which one is from the school that you went to. One of the concerns about vocational education is that some models, it's in lieu of what you would normally get in high school. Um, and there are a lot of people that believe that if you uh, don't get the complete high school education, that you will be uh, very much at a disadvantage if you later try to switch jobs. You need the basic, um, ba basic education and that the apprenticeship or vocational education ought to be in addition to that. Um, Mr. Bradley, can you comment on, on that? Uh, so in Australia, your compulsory education, I think, is for 10 years and then the final two years, um, which the vast majority undertake, um, uh, are technically optional. Um, you can begin a, an apprenticeship while at school and still complete the final two years of your high schooling, um, where you'll end up with the equivalent of a high school diploma. But the apprenticeship does not dim diminish uh, your otherwise compulsory education. No, I would say it, it adds to it. Um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Bradley, uh, a concept that I think we call stackable. That is, when you get a credential, if you go a little further, you can add to that credential. Uh, can you say a word about why that's important? Sure. So I think um, the two upsides, I suppose, to the to stackable credentials. One is that it recognises past learning. So once you've completed a program uh, and your competency level is to a, to a certain extent, then um, uh, the next qualification that you undertake, you'll receive credit for, for, past, for past learning and past activities. Um, and two, I would say that it gives you a path out as well. So if you're committing to a, a three-year diploma or a two-year diploma, um, if after six months, a year, 18 months, um, you decide it's not for you or you have uh, another op opportunity in front of you, it's not lost time, you're still walking away with some qualification, some credential that's recognised for your time. Yeah. Um, Are there some apprenticeships for jobs that, are tradition that traditionally require a four-year college degree? 
Not to my knowledge. So after an apprenticeship, you'll receive the equivalent of, um, at most, a diploma, which is... Well, is some, some jobs you, in finance or something like that, you would you traditionally get a four-year college degree. Sorry, not, not in a formal sense. Not, not, not what I would call an apprenticeship. There would be, um, uh, once, you've, once you've done a four-year degree, or the equivalent of... Um, certainly, I think you know, workplace learning is going to be a very significant part of where you go to next. And, and from, from economics to science to finance, uh, across all those fields, it's going to be... Do either of the other witnesses have um, apprenticeships for jobs that traditionally require a four-year degree? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Um, before we, we go to the next... Um, Questioner, I want to go to Dr. Fox, who has an introduction to me. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I, I have a program called Teacher in Congress, where every year I bring two teachers up to shadow me for about 10 days. And the two teachers who are here from the 5th District are in the audience today. They're Jody Carpenter and Justin Colbert. And I just wanted to recognize them. Uh, they are both teachers in the public schools in the 5th District, and they're here to see how Congress works behind the scenes. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to introduce them. Do, do they want to stay out? Oh, OK, they're there. Great, thank you very much for being here. OK, um, we're going to go next uh, to Mr. Levin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thanks for having this hearing. Uh, it's extremely important uh, the role apprenticeships can play in our workplaces. And I, I, I really want to talk about um, where, why young people be interested in this. And I want to ask questions about that. But before, I'd like to ask permission to enter into the uh, record an article or really a program from PBS NewsHour um, about the need for more tradespeople after all the focus on four-year colleges. Okay, all right. So, uh, you know, Dr. Annan, I wanted to ask you about why young people would want to do this. There's a huge emphasis in this country about free college. Everyone should go to college. The assumption is the four-year degree is the ticket to uh, a decent life. And um, I don't think there's any economist that has a model of the economy that would require more than, generously speaking, 60 65% of people to have a four-year degree. There are lots of other jobs that we need filled. But speaking from your experience, evidently one in two uh, compulsory school graduates uh, choose a vocational pathway, if I have that right, something like that in, in Germany. What factors would you say make apprenticeships more appealing for students to choose a vocational pathway in, in, in Germany? Yeah, I think um, in Germany that the system itself has a very good reputation, so um, it's very um, broadly known by the society and very well accepted. And also um, we have um, counseling like um, in Switzerland, like there are the chambers, there's our employment agency. So people actually know about this and they don't know only about higher education as an option um, after they finish their general um, education. So, and also um, the income that they can make during the apprenticeship and also what they can earn afterwards if they do further training. So I know a lot of people who actually um, were able to have a good career that pays off just as much as if you uh, would have a master degree or uh, um, some comparable higher education qualification. And we've also done some research about this. So over a lifetime, it might be that higher education pays off a little better, but you make the money earlier in your career. And it depends on the further and the continuing education and the willingness of yourself to, to um, do this lifelong learning. So it, it brings you into employment very early, and it's very attractive. For Are the min do the minimum standards include wage standards in your minimum standards of your apprenticeships? Um, we want to do this in our um, actual reform. So ac actually at the moment, the minimum wage is not um, valid for apprentices, but now we are doing a re reform and that's what we want to implement in the next year, that minimum wages also applies to apprentices. 
Thank you. Um, well, let me ask any of you who wish to respond. You, you've talked about um, th that your federal national regulations and laws, the governing your apprenticeships, are updated. How often are they updated, and what have recent updates to the legislation or regulations in your respective countries sought to achieve? So here you're mentioning raising the wages. What, what other uh, things have you been doing to update your, uh, you know, your, your apprenticeship programs, in, whether in Australia or Switzerland or Germany? Any? If you're talking about the Vocational Training Act, we've updated yes. it in 2005, Sorry, yeah. and it's like if we see problems with the examinations um, or if we see um, problems with certain um, target groups of vocational education, we try to adjust this. Um, and talking about the training regulations, it depends, as I said before, on the occupation, so how dynamic the sector is, so we are regularly updating this. It's something between, I would say, five and ten years when we update them, depending on the occupation. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it also depends what we're talking about, like the, the broader reforms that take, they take place uh, probably every couple of decades, like we had the last one in the early 2000s when we further streamlined the system and integrated professions that were previously not part of, of the apprenticeship model, like, like uh, in healthcare, for instance. And, but for each of those 230 occupations, um, we update them every five years at least, often also, also uh, earlier, because usually it's because of technological change. And that's at the so federal, fast. you're at the national level. Yeah, it's always on, at the national level, but of course uh, a company, a, an employer, they, they could decide to do more. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm out of time, uh, but I would just point out that... Um, you know, what you describe as minimum standards are really quite high standards, and it's impressive to me as somebody who needs to help, you know, make the laws of our country that you all, each of your countries maintains very high standards for apprentices to make sure that they get a great education and have a great standard of living afterwards, and that's something we can aspire to here. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Levin. Mr. Trone. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Davis and Ranking Member Smucker for holding this uh, very important hearing, and thank you for the witnesses uh, for being here. Uh, as a firm, former employer uh, with over 7,000 uh, team members uh, that work for my company, uh, my favorite area is human resources. And that's unusual for an entrepreneur, but being part of the human resources, investing in people. And what you folks are doing in entrepreneur, uh, entre you know, apprenticeships in Europe is just phenomenal. Uh, we were out yesterday at the Plumbers and Gas Fitters Local 5, and they're doing very similar work that's excellent, and it's earn while you learn, as uh, Ranking Member Fox spoke about earlier. Um, and the folks, of course, leave with zero debt. Uh, very impressive. So we need to clearly learn from the European model uh, in all, all your countries. But what's been done at the federal level to assure equal access? So everybody can participate, regardless of gender, disability, age, or race. Whoever wants to go first. I, I just said, um, so I think um, for, for um, especially for uh, disabled people or um, for people with a, a migration background, we've got special programs in place to, to make them ready and to pro provide um, kind of trainability to them so that they have the language skills that they need and that they also have the general education background to, to access um, an apprenticeship. So we try to um, include those people. Dr. Marty. Thank you. Um, so overall, currently we, we have um, overall the problem that uh, there are m many more apprenticeship positions open than, than we have um, people who would fill them. So in a way, that's, I think that's, that makes this problem uh, a less difficult one. But at the same time, I think we have the biggest challenges probably with um, immigrants from countries that do not know apprenticeship models because they, so they're not really aware of it to the extent uh, people would be aware of it whose parents come from a country that knows apprenticeship. So there, I think it really plays a big role during the last two years of, of compulsory education to convince them of the value 
for themselves, for, for them, after, after uh, graduating from, from compulsory school. Could you also speak to the various ways the Swiss uh, VET system is fully embedded in Switzerland's overall education system and some, maybe share some successes and challenges you face in that system? Yeah, so it is fully embedded in the sense that you can move around in it. Like, uh, for instance, you can do an apprenticeship and then you can add uh, what we call vocational baccalaureate that, that grants you free access without exam to a University of Applied Science. But you can also do the opposite. You can, you can uh, go to academic high school where you typically would continue your pathway towards a, a research university, but you, you realize that the University of Applied Science would be much more interesting and in that case, you first would need to, to get practical experience because otherwise you would be disadvantaged compared to people with an apprenticeship background at that University of Applied Science. So it works both ways and, uh, and, and it happens both ways that people move around in that system. Right. The Trump administration established a task force to study apprenticeships and they recommended we put apprenticeships opportunities in every high school in America, which I think is a damn good idea. So what are the specific steps uh, your countries have taken to lead such high school participation? Because nothing has happened here. What should we be doing to look at moving this forward? Mr. Bradley? So nationwide, we, uh, all, all high school students have an opportunity to participate in a, uh, a schools-based apprenticeship in their final two years of schooling. So that's um, uh, students in the years 11 and 12 that are able to access that, that program. Uh, we, are, we have just completed a review of the sector more broadly, to go back to your earlier question. Uh, we are looking to move the, the Australian VET system to a, what we're calling a more modern, applied, fast-paced alternative to classroom-based learning. Uh, and part of, the, that, part of that, those reforms, it's uh, about providing clearer secondary school pathways to, um, to apprenticeships, to vocational training, and also greater access for disadvantaged Australians as well. Quickly, Dr. Emin. Um, I think in Germany it's based on, we have a broad agreement between the federal states and the federal government um, to um, promote vocational education and training, and it's a, a com complementary system where schools feel responsible for the educational part and where they also invest to make sure that people are provided with the best possible education in both learning venues. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, okay. Uh, I wanna note for the subcommittee that Representative Fred Keller of Pennsylvania is permitted to participate in today's hearing and I recognize him for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Davis, and thank you to the panel for, for being here today. Uh, just a couple questions and, and whoever would like to go first on the panel may. Um, wondering about um, prospective students and how they're recruited by apprenticeship programs uh, for, are they, by the apprenticeship programs or the employers, do they recruit the students? Either in Germany, they are responsible for the recruitment themselves, and um, as I said, the chambers, as the um, organizations of the business sector, they have information and counseling services for the young people in place, and also our employment agency has, but responsible um, are also, the, uh, the, the companies are responsible to hire them and to, to do the contract with them. And, um, uh, Earlier, it was asked about the standards. So, basically, in our in our law, you don't need a general um, educational certificate to start an apprenticeship. Although the business is the limiting factor, so the, the companies decide whom they want to hire and whom they think um, has this trainability and whether they think they can complete a successful uh, apprenticeship with these people. Okay. So that would mean that the, the the people that want to be apprentices would have to qualify with the businesses. They have to apply model. at the company and then the company um, will have an assessment with them and they decide which ones they want to hire and whom they want to offer a training contract. So it's not just basically open to anybody that wants to learn that, that skill or that job? It's not like we, we've, we've got a, a, a lot of, like in Switzerland, we've got a lot of not filled um, apprenticeship places and occupations where they're maybe not that popular and we've got uh, some occupations where are more people wanting to uh, learn this job than we have apprenticeship places. So you might have some people that want to learn something, but basically nobody has picked them up in that apprenticeship program. That can happen. Okay. Anybody else on how yours work? So uh, 
small, small adjustment to that as well, I suppose. So um, there is a model in which you can, the employer will be responsible for entering into a contract with an apprentice and take them on as, as, as an apprentice. Um, through our group training model, uh, group training organisations act as an intermediary. So it's, it can be a community group or a uh, industry-led group which will take on a cohort of apprentices and then place those apprentices uh, with, with employers on a project by project, um, specific needs, seasonal work um, as, as required. Okay. Dr. Marty, any, anything different? Thank you. No, it's, I think it's similar as in, as in Germany that they, that they apply the, the students after compulsory education or to work, uh, in the last year of compulsory education. Uh, they apply with companies and companies, however, they also advertise a, a lot because they, they want to have the best, the best talents. Okay. So do you track the, the individuals as far as any kind of diversity or so forth that, that, that go through their apprenticeship programs or is it just basically based on who's, who's qualified and who they select to go through these? The, the, the government does not interfere in that application process that works between the students and, and, and the employers. But it is true that some students, they have a, for instance, they would like to go to a profession where there are a very limited number of uh, uh, apprenticeship slots open. So what, what they would do often is they would go to look for a, for a bridge year maybe, okay. like a 10th school year for instance, where they would work also specifically on some of their weaknesses in order to, uh, they, they would see what could they improve to get to an apprenticeship that that they would like to do. Sometimes uh, they would reevaluate their, their options and apply for another apprenticeship. Okay. Uh, I thank the panel and I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Guthrie? Thank you very much. And I'm so sorry. I had another hearing that was dealing with the opioid crisis and fentanyl and other things are happening to our young people that we needed to be there. And I apologize for not being here for the discussion, but this is important, positive things that, that we can look at how we're gonna train our young people. And uh, Chair Davis and I had, had been real interested in the Swiss model. We studied a lot of the Swiss model and what um, apprenticeships here, a lot of it is kind of focused on more blue collar, uh, technical skills, which we absolutely need and have absolutely fantastic careers uh, in doing so. And, and the problem that, that we, we've talked about going back and forth is just the kind of the perception here that, that that's what apprenticeships are. And that's kind of what they are here in, in the Swiss model. You've seen people who were bankers, who were, it, it was a, apprenticeships were pathways to professional careers as well. Uh, specifically, I know of an instance in a Nestle lab where people, where they had teenagers, young people, high, what we would call high school, in apprenticeship programs learning how to make protein, I guess dehydrated, transportables, they could send it to, to Africa. And, and, and they were gonna be lab, professionals, not, not in the technical skills, which again, before I go any further, those are absolutely honorable, great jobs and we need more of them in our country. But could you talk about the, just kind of the professional apprenticeship? You may have already, and I apologize if you have, but real interested in kind of the pathway where it seemed like after what we would call our freshman year of high school, I know it's not equivalent, but essentially somewhat the people would continue on a pathway of more of an academic career. And it seemed like two thirds or maybe 60% of Swiss citizens would go in the apprenticeship program, and like I said, lead to all kinds of careers, not just uh, construction trades and those types of things. Could you talk about that? Thank you very much, yeah, I, I like to do that. So, so yeah, it's 230 very um, different fields usually and rather comprehensive, however, like we don't have, for instance, an apprenticeship, uh, a youth apprenticeship in accounting. This would be part of a commercial employee apprenticeship ship, for instance, in banking or in insurance, where you learn many other skills than just accounting, for instance. And, um, and uh, yeah, you, you see that in, in, other, in other fields as well. And yeah, um, may, maybe, uh, can you... Pre, uh, well, I just, just wanted to comment on how, how apprenticeships are equivalent or prestigious in viewed as the Swiss society. I, I think one question was, how did you get over the hump of you can go be a professional and go to have, not have to have a four-year degree from a college university? And, and somebody made the comment that that was kind of what Switzerland has always done. It's kind of the guild system. It goes back several hundred years, so we don't have that same kind of... I think it is here. seen as prestigious. Also, when you see that we have quite a consistent percentage of, of about 68, 67% uh, participating in it. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, it's, it's more the demographics currently that created a situation where we have many more apprenticeship positions open. I promise Mr. Smucker I'll give you some time, but this, yeah. so the, about a third of the U.S. has four-year degrees, and you're saying 65% go to go to apprenticeships. Yeah, two-thirds so, go two -thirds. to apprenticeships. So what we're trying to do is we have a system that, that we're not focusing on two-thirds going to apprenticeships, but still only a third are getting college degrees. So I will yield to Mr. Smucker. So y'all seem to have a good handle on it, is my point. Thank you. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. I've uh, been hard to stay quiet here. I've had a lot, a lot of questions, and so I'm going to take this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. I want to follow up uh, first to some of the line of questioning that Mr. Levin asked earlier, which I thought were some very good questions in regards to how we think here about uh, a baccalaureate degree versus going directly to the workforce through some earn and learn program. That's changing. We have for decades told our students that you know, the, the only pathway to the workforce is through a four-year degree. It was a disservice, it was, it was a mistake. We, we're gradually changing that, and certainly here, we understand the value of apprenticeship programs and other uh, earn while you learn models, and I think it's changing in the country as well. Uh, but I'd like to drill down a little. In the students that do not go to a four-year degree, students that go directly to the workforce, there's still a large percentage here in the United States that are doing that, but not doing it through an apprenticeship program. So there are a lot of different pathways. Uh, it may be they walk into an employer and the employer just has their own internal training. It may be through a career and technical school where they go to, for two years and then enter the workforce. Uh, I'm curious in your countries, and you may have to answer this later, I'm running out of time, but in your countries, is there still a percentage of the workforce that does not go to a four-year degree but enters the job, uh, the workforce through some other pathway other than an apprenticeship program. Are we going to have? A yeah, I that think or? I think Mr. Smucker, if we can go to Miss Wild and then yes. we'll come back Thank to you, you and, and continue with with Keep that. Keep that in mind for later. That would be great, or I'm going to get into trouble here. So, <laughs> so I want to turn to to Miss Wild, and we had uh, recognized her earlier that she's not on the subcommittee, but we had given her permitted permission uh, to join us for five minutes. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to the panel for being here. This is a subject of great interest to me, which is why I'm here, even though I'm not on this subcommittee. Um, Dr. Annan, I'm happy to say that in September I will be visiting Germany, which is the country of my birth. Um, haven't been there for a very long time, but one of the things that I'm hoping to do while I am on that trip is to visit some of the manufacturers who have locations in my district in Pennsylvania, of which there are several. Um, and to learn more about the apprentice programs that are utilized there because I think they're so incredibly important. So I'm going to direct this question to you, but if either of the other two witnesses would like to chime in, um, I'm happy to, to hear from any one of you. Um, one of the greatest concerns we have in this country, I think, and probably in most countries, is that we have a lot of industries that are, that are dying and, are, and, and being taken or being replaced by newer technologies um, and, and newer developments in those kinds of industries. And I guess my question is this, how do you incorporate the need to, to um, employ, to, to educate people in those new upcoming industries, um, number one, and, and bring them into the apprenticeship program if they are perhaps part of a, an industry that is on its way out or, or part of a dying industry? That's number, that's part of my question. And the other is, um, you know, I feel really strongly that we can't just focus on younger people um, as the future of work. And um, what do we, I, I'm trying to understand more about what we do to help people who are middle-aged, but still very much a part of the workforce, um, and who have to voluntarily or involuntarily transition to a new industry. So I'll stop and see what kind of response you might have for me on that. 
Um, so yeah, I think um, that the uh, innovation, the digitalization, the technolo uh, technological change um, is something that will highly affect um, every labor market across the globe. And we are also facing this in Germany. And we are seeing that um, over time there are some occupations where we need to abolish them because they are no longer needed. And we have to also train those people into uh, other fields and make sure that they are provided the skills that they actually need, which companies already do which is not necessarily highly regulated. And we also have um, um, big opportunities regarding continuing education, which is very low bar in Germany. So there is no training necessarily needed. So if you've done um, workplace learning, if you've um, acquired competences in an informal way, that's also something that provides you with the skills that you would need. And for passing those um, examinations related to those certificates, you would not necessarily need to go into a training course. So we try to keep it as flexible as possible also for older people who have learned during their work during their work in the company so that they can um, also get a certificate that um, actually um, contains those skills. And we're trying to, to work as closely together as we can with the companies and we do a lot of research on this so try, that we try to figure out as early as possible. To, we do projections in which fields um, we might have the biggest needs and also try to develop um, the training regulations as early as possible to keep track of this. So if I understand what you're saying then, um, people would be um, trained while still in whatever their industry might be that it perhaps is not going to be an industry of the future, to evolve into a worker who can service a newer upcoming industry mm -hmm. without, without downtime? Yeah, but I think there are some industry, for me, IT is a good example. You do not necessarily have people, older age people who work in IT nowadays who have a formal qualification in this field because it just didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. And now we're formalizing it over time and the younger people, they maybe have this formal training in the field and we try to um, yeah, keep it up to date as good as possible, but there are uh, dynamics in the companies and in the sectors that just um, evolve naturally and that we try to formalize afterwards sometimes. So that's um, how we approach this. Thank you. That's very helpful. You probably know that we have a lot of discussion here in the, con in the uh, space of climate change and renewable energies and that kind of thing, and then we've got people working in the fossil fuel industry who need to transition into new new forms of employment without suffering a real interruption to their economic well-being. So your information is very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I turn to Mr. Smucker for your five minutes. So, so again, my question is the students who are not going to a four-year degree who are entering the workforce through some sort of career and technical training or through on-the-job training, how important in each of your countries is apprenticeship as a part of that? And how many, uh, how many students are involved in apprenticeship programs as opposed to other on-the-job learning programs? I uh, have some figures here. So we, we roughly have about, uh, we roughly have about 260,000 um, apprentices uh, in the system at the moment, um, compared to um, I think it's about just short of a million or just about a, a million in higher ed. So granted higher ed, it will have a longer duration, but um, that's relatively the proportions. There are, of course, um, those that choose not to do either. They go straight into the workforce um, or, or have, a, have a gap year, have, a, have an extension as well. So you're saying straight into the workforce rather than through an apprenticeship yes. program. How many would you have? Of I, I don't have those figures okay. in front of me, I'm sorry. Um, I also can't tell you the exact number for Germany, but I think it's a um, very big political um, discussion in Germany, and we also try to put um, measures and approaches in place um, that recognize this informal um, learning that these people have acquired. So that we, we have the option, for example, within the apprenticeship, we have the option of a so-called external examination, where you can apply once you've done, um, you've learned in the workplace one and a half time as long as the regular apprenticeship is, and you can prove that you have this practical experience and then you can also challenge the exam and you can get the certificate afterwards so that it's not necessarily that you directly enter through the formal route. How about in Switzerland? Yeah, in Switzerland, we actually measure it at age 25 and there we see that uh, two-thirds two have an apprenticeship degree and 25% have, uh, have a general education degree like academic high school, baccalaureate. And, uh, and uh, so overall 91 percent 91 percent have some 
upper secondary, have not some, have, have really uh, an upper secondary degree. So 9% uh, don't have that. Yeah, uh, the re reason I ask the question, the reason I ask the question is you all of your systems obviously place more value on apprenticeship uh, programs as opposed to other as opposed to what we do here. More people involved, more industries involved, and more students involved. And I guess you know if I'm a student in in one of your systems, what is the value of an apprenticeship program of being part of a registered apprenticeship program as opposed to uh, on the job learning in some other form why would i choose an apprenticeship program i think um once you have the certificate you're uh, very mobile on the labor market and you actually have something that proves um what skills um you've acquired and also um regarding collective um, wage agreements um once you have the certificate you're um, able to receive a certain amount of money as a salary which you're not necessarily if you're considered as an untrained or whatever worker so that's an advantage sure anyone else want to address that mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah, I think I think the degree to which you you receive training and education during the apprenticeship is so much more comprehensive than if you would just learn on the job, because because it is dual. You learn all the theoretical background of all the things that you do in an applied way, and and also the the, the applied like the the practical part is very structured. We also have intercompany courses that are a mix. So in a way, it's not just dual. In a way, it's three places where you learn. It's the vocational school, it's the employer where you participate in actual work streams, and then it's intercompany courses where you learn uh, practical methods in a more systematic way. And when you when you would learn on the job, you you would miss out on all yeah. that. I, I think that's that's great. One of the barriers here, and I'm curious how each of your countries handle it. If I am a new company who has not participated in apprenticeship programs before. It can be a rigorous process to, to get approved for an apprenticeship program within an individual company. It's, an, it's already an existing apprenticeship program, but not for that specific company. How do uh, each of your systems handle that? So in, in Germany, the chambers take care of this and they make sure that um, the whole facilities in the company allow to train the recommended standards that are um, written down in the uh, training standards. And also they um, have a qualification for the trainers, the in-company trainers, um, to make sure that they're personal and professionally um, able to train those people. And so we have um, some quality assurance measures in place to make that sure. And also chambers um, provide and support um, companies in getting ready to do uh, apprenticeships. Thank you very much, Mr. Smucker. And now I'm gonna go for my five minutes and we're gonna try and summarize after that and maybe ask an additional question if, if, if we have one. Um, I wanted to, to, to really turn to this whole issue of stakeholders. Um, and because I, as I understand it, you have um, a oversight from stakeholders, from businesses, as well as the state. Uh, and how, can you help us understand a little bit more about how that's integrated and uh, where, you know, whether, whether the, um, I guess just how important that is, because as, you, as you've heard, we sometimes think that if you have standards, then you have regulations, which could overwhelm businesses. And I know that you know we're looking now at the industry-recognized apprenticeship programs. We, we don't have answers to that. I wouldn't ask you to, to uh, even define that at this point, because there's still a lot of details that haven't, haven't uh, uh, been, been really brought forward. But who are the... Who controls all this? You know, how do you make sure that the people who are providing some oversight uh, in the different occupations, where do you find them, and how do they mesh with the state system? I think um, without ex without explaining the bureaucracy, and I and I guess the question is, is it a great big bureaucracy? Because what we're grappling with is how do you do this in a, a simple enough way that people are invested in it, businesses are invested, they they don't feel overwhelmed by it, or that it's going to make them crazy. How how does all that come together? 
I think in a short-term perspective, maybe it would be easier for each company if they just see that there is a need and they just adjust it themselves in a short perspective. But um, over a long term, they, they actually they, they get the advantage that they have a broad skilled workforce in their branch once we have this regulated established standards. And so it's in their own interest. Once they want to recruit um, other people, they know exactly what they can expect and they have um, a broader um, opportunity to get young people who are skilled um, for their own company. And also, it's a lot about this um, vocational identity that we create with this um, apprenticeships. It's like the Berufs concept, what we have in Germany, this occupation, I think that's a very important component in our system. And that's um, something like we can almost um, call it a brand. It's like if we want to abolish an occupation, it's most of the times that trade unions and employer organizations, we can't give up on this brand. So maybe just to interrupt at this point. So what, what happens if, if one of the um, occupations, if somehow the program is not doing well, do these stakeholders close it down? Um, what would I, they do if, if they felt that the apprentices were not being protected, that they were getting good value for their time? Can they do that? I wouldn't say it's necessarily a question of oversight. I think the, the way industry plays a role is it's about, um, it's about providing inputs, um, uh, advice more than, than oversight per se. Um, we do monitor and evaluate through our uh, research uh, organisation, the NCVER, uh, we, we, in terms of surveys of employers, um, and, uh, apprentices, what was their experience like, uh, are they meeting the needs of industry and so on. So we're closely monitoring that. We have what's called an industry skills council, which are set up for different sectors, uh, which then provide a formal mechanism to provide the, the input uh, and advice to government to say, um, this is working and this is not working, we need to change things. Are they able to shut it down per se? No, I think it's going to be more a, a question of um, apprentices voting with their feet or firms voting with their feet and, and walking away from the, the system. Mm -hmm. It's a competitive process. Um, Can I ask you quickly too, uh, just about, the, um, we know trades obviously have been involved here for, for a number of years. Um, what role do unions play? How, how does that work? within the process of establishing a training regulation. So um, I think in Germany it's very important that we have this agreement between the social partners so that both think that this is actually a broad qualification, that is, there is a long-term need, and that's a big interest for the tra uh, trade unions, so that it's not this narrow qualifications which are just short-term, because they want to make sure that people are qualified for, mm -hmm. for the future and that they have broad opportunities afterwards once they go through an apprenticeship like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, perhaps Dr. Varney, you want to comment on that? But I, I just, if you could in include in, in, in your, in your uh, question quickly, um, we obviously put a greater premium on colleges and universities. I mean, that's kind of what students and parents want. So what about the prestige factor for parents? I'm, I'm assuming that because you have the standards, then people know that they can count on that, that that's going, the, the the end result, if you will, is going to be positive in terms of job and the ability to raise a family, et cetera. What, is that, am I correct in that, or is there something else that we're missing in terms of prestige factor for families? Yeah, the, that's a good question. I, the role of the parents is also important, of course, and we observe that the, that plays, of course, the family background plays a big role in, in what pathway young people choose. So we, we do see that, for instance, when both parents or one parent uh, has an academic background, the probability that their children uh, is taking the academic route, like towards a university, is, is higher. That's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. Okay. And vice versa also. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Smucker, do you want to summarize or ask more questions? Go ahead. I do have uh, two questions. So one I mentioned earlier, we've graded our schools uh, by how many of their students went to a university rather than through uh, directly to a career through apprenticeship program or otherwise. How do your schools think about this? And, and I'll just say it in the context, in the district that I represent, there are some really great new partnerships developing between the schools, the secondary schools, and businesses where students are moving directly to the workforce, maybe through an apprenticeship program, and schools are beginning to really value that as opposed to all students going directly to a, a four-year degree. So I'm just curious how, how your schools think about such things. 
So I think that um, it's both equal opportunities. So I didn't mention our qualification framework, but it has also like in Australia, it has eight levels and you can choose the vocational route and you can choose the um, general or higher educational route and you can just end up in the same positions in the labor market and you can also reach degrees which are on an equal level. So it's like, it's not equal, the, the contents are not equal, but it's on an equal level and we look at it like it's equal opportunities and it offers the same career perspectives and there is this permeability between the system and people take those routes um, vice versa, so there is permeability in the system and so it's not like um, I would say one thing is better than the other, they are different and they offer different advantages and disadvantages. So. Is, that, is that similar in Australia, Mr. Bradley? I'd say it's a work in progress, it's having the similar kind of issues around stigma that, that mm -hmm. you're experiencing here. Um, uh, there is a strong dominance of, of university higher education over, over vocational um, pathways. Um, so much so, every every year the high school certificate results are celebrated, and these these were uh, the results for these schools or these high schools, and this is where their students are going. That's public. That's you know a big fanfare is made of that. Sure, uh, Dr. Marty. Rather than answer that, uh, since I'm close to running out of time, another barrier that I've seen in those partnerships is we have uh, labor laws that prevent students under 18. Uh, 16 to 17 year olds uh, sometimes from participating in workforces where they're around machinery. It's something that I've uh, heard back from employers in my area who would like to have students participating in what we call pre-apprenticeship programs at our high schools but are prevented uh, from doing so uh, because of some of those what I think are outdated laws. Do you run into that in Switzerland at all? You mentioned one of the takeaways I think that I heard today is that all of your countries get students involved in apprenticeship programs at an earlier age than we do here. So I'm curious whether that is an issue. Yeah, it, I, I remember that there was an issue when we had more, more people uh, entering apprenticeship already at age 15. I, I think that we needed to change some something there and adapt a little bit, but with, at age 16, I'm not aware of problems. Okay. Yeah, also, yeah, I, th I think that that's, that works. Yeah, I think we need to, one of the things we need to do here is look at our rules and laws around that, perhaps make some changes to, uh, to make that access uh, to the workforce easier at a younger age. Yep. But that's, that's a discussion for another day. Uh, I only have a minute or so, so I do want to uh, just finish by uh, thanking uh, each of you for taking the time to be here today to share your perspectives, share your best practices. I can tell you, for myself, it was very useful uh, to hear um, your experiences and your perspectives. So it's, uh, this was invaluable. I'd like to thank the chairwoman again for, uh, for scheduling this hearing. We all want to see this skills gap uh, shrink and see the needs of our local communities and employers met. And in order to do that, we must encourage flexibility uh, in the system. We must encourage employer-led uh, innovation. Uh, so I was in particularly encouraged to hear today about the potential that can be realized when not just your governments, but all the stakeholders, students, employers, educators, uh, are brought into this uh, promise, really, of, of apprenticeships. Uh, students and families should never feel stigmatized for taking the path, that, the path that is best for them. They should be free to choose among different types of education on the pathway to a permanent job. The sharing and learning from the best practices of those around us, like yourselves today, is even more important in today's uh, rapidly involving economy. So again, I particularly appreciate the opportunity to hold this discussion with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smucker, and, and to all of you again. I wonder if you could just take with your breadth of experience for a moment, maybe this is a cautionary tale or, 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 or something different, but I'm just wondering if you have, having heard you know, uh, this discussion today and, and, and a number of the questions. And obviously, we have a very different system here uh, on some levels, and we're trying to figure out, do we have to change it all, or we, can we incorporate um, more apprenticeship scale, the, these apprenticeships uh, across many, many different careers um, in our system, or do we need to, to make some changes? But I wonder, you know, is there one or two pieces of advice that you have uh, in closing, whether it's advice about something that has worked especially well in your system, in terms of whether it's innovation or the school design, um, or something for us to avoid doing? 
Um, what is that cautionary tale that you, would, you might like to offer to us as we close? Dr. Anne, would you want to? My recommendation would just be to look at the government and at the business community as partners that work together for one goal, which is providing um, yeah, good apprenticeships and good qualified training to young people. And that's in both interests, in the government's interest and in the business and the company's interest. And um, I think in Germany, this principle of consensus is really one thing that makes it very successful because we have people together on board within the whole process. And that's what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Mr. Bradley. Uh, I, I guess, you know, we're all talking about skill shortages here. Uh, and my response to that is that it has to be easy. You know, we're out there begging for employers to come to the table and we need to say to them, um, here, uh, here is a, uh, uh, an apprentice that will um, uh, be of value to your firm and to the, the, the work that you're doing. So it needs to be uh, as streamlined as possible, as utilitous as possible, um, to bring them into the system and show the value of, of what's being done. Uh, and flexible. So I, I, mm -hmm. I would say do have a look at our group training model um, in a bit more depth um, and how that provides um, access to small firms, to medium firms, as well as, as large firms on a, on a um, as-needs basis. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Marty. Thank you. Yeah, from a Swiss experience, I, I would like to yeah, fo focus on those three main features I mentioned earlier. I think the labor market orientation is very really important to keep it relevant, to, to have relevant uh, apprenticeships. And the partnership of the different stakeholders is, is important for a well-functioning system. Uh, that it works uh, reliable and and, uh, and seamlessly. And finally, also the permeability, I think, is very important for uh, the perspective of, of everyone and mm -hmm. for the dynamics, because we don't know what kind of labor market we will have in 10 years or 20 years. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much, because we are, are also thinking about the future. Uh, as well as the president. We need, we need help and support in both. And again, I want to thank you very much. I mean, I think you, you all have identified the, the major themes that we're questioning, you know, and how we can work um, in perhaps a new way to, to make this work for many more students who would not have the ability to probably, you know, go to a friend's um, business, perhaps, and, and just ask for a job. I mean, this is something on a scale that is really... Uh, has such benefit, I think, in the long run, and we want to, to do that. So uh, I know that we want to uh, ensure that apprenticeship opportunities in the U.S. are not relegated to alternative pathways uh, either and uh, be a valued, a competitive, and a rigorous uh, pathway for all students uh, to reach their full potential. So we thank you very much. Again, thank you for your travel, and uh, we look forward to having uh, further discussions. And we are adjourned. <laughs>